Okay. Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone in the room and welcome everyone online. Indeed, we have our friends online. I can see Stefano and Max. The others, if you're so inspired to turn on your camera so we can see you, of course you don't have to, but um, we, we, we would be very happy if you did. Um, now I'd like to uh, simply say a few words in our collect common name, John Eric Fossum and I, Professor Fossum and I, uh, decided to con to convene this workshop together as the, one of the last legs of this EU 3D program that we've had in collaboration with EUI as well as Oxford for the last four years, uh, led by ARENA. Uh, and we will say a bit more about this program in a moment. In fact, I'll say a bit more when I present in a moment. Um, but today, this is a joint workshop between this program and the program on transnational democracy in the 21st century, which I lead at STG under a cluster that is EUI uh, wide and that Elmas and Andrea are helping to coordinate. So thanks, thank you for, for that. Um, this, I know the room is a bit daunting, but the whole idea of the workshop is to put ideas on the table and to have a series of brainstorming around this theme. Uh, yeah. So let's be as informal as we can. The first time you will speak, you will introduce yourself, whether speakers uh, that are listed in the program or anyone. In fact, we don't wanna have a big distinction between speakers on the program, except a few bigger presentation, the two of us. <laughs> and, but, but you know, uh, well, not except, I mean, there are some presentations but let's try to make this as informal as we can. And indeed, the, the first bit of this title, transformative transnational governance in part is to say, look, we have a school of transnational governance here at EUI. We speak a lot descriptively or analytically. Let's, let's just give ourselves the luxury of being normative about it. How can we transform? What are the normative benchmarks to transform transnational governance in a time where the Ukraine war and all of this talk about uh, transition really calls for thinking much more systematically about an old hat and an old theme of the legitimacy of transnational governance. Now, our angle with John Eric and the program has been this whole idea of the tension between democracy and domination transnationally. And, uh, and therefore, the goal is democratic resilience in the world, domestically and internationally, through transformation, through innovation. That's kind of the agenda. And within that free for all, please feel free to bring in your bugbears and whatever you want to put on the, on, on the table. So this is for the introduction to this um, workshop. Can you put on the slides, my slides? So, now we have, as you know, from the program, I, we decided not to print the program. Are you all okay with that? So you, everybody has it electronically. If anybody doesn't have it or needs anything, Andrea is here to help, but I think we're all good. And so enough for framing. Um, we, as you know, we have two sessions today, two sessions tomorrow with a lot of social time in between, hopefully, all of this before the SOU, which will of course bring back some of these themes. Um, and so this, this afternoon, we will start with a session uh, where I'm going to present some of the work I did for EU 3D, uh, and, um, and then we're going to move on to a second session where John Eric Fossum leads. In the first session, I will first speak, and then Franca will uh, present her really interesting work on, on, on militant democracy. And we have Olivier here here and Stefano online, as well as Liz. I don't know if she's already with us. Not yet. Not yet, so she'll be, who are gonna kick off the discussion afterwards and open it up. Okay. So, mm -hmm. slides. So uh, how do we think about transformative transnational governance? There are many ways to do so. I want to speak specifically about 
how we think about the whole world of transnational governance as a complex differentiated system where democracy is sometimes enhanced but most of the time mitigated. Uh, and the biggest source of this presentation is a paper that, that was sent to all of you, has much more detail, so you can go to it, uh, Differentiation, Dominance and Democratic trans, uh, um, Congruence, which, where, which was supported uh, by research of, um, assistance by Adrian, who is here, as well as Stefano online, and Ruven and Pablo, uh, but Ruven and Pablo couldn't uh, be with us, if I am right. No. Okay, so, but there is, I'm also going to bring in some of my other work, just alluding to it uh, on, on economic governance in general, post-colonial Europe, Europe, transnational solidarity, etc. So the starting point of this story on this slide is a big macro one, and I want to emphasize, yes, we're talking about democracy, but democracy is underpinned by an infrastructure of interest, more or less overlapping, more or less in Cleveland uh, at the global level. And here are the big boxes. You, know, you have all sorts of crisis creating social discontent and people always ask who pays, who is bono, and who suffers. And this is in every crisis that we face. So who's gonna decide who pays and who suffers within and across countries? And of course, this is in the context of two mega transition, green transition uh, and the digital transition, where indeed, again, these questions of distribution and who decides the distribution are a paramount. And of course, now with the Ukraine war, we have, we have always had the geopolitics, who has power globally, who can decide who, uh, who pays, but then who is going to attract to their model of doing so. So this is the big macro context, but I don't think we can talk democracy without putting this, all of our conversation in this broad context of conflicting interest. Uh, now, one variant or one way of framing this story is this slide, which I wanted to put on the table because um, it's one of the ways in which I have long framed the challenge of transnational governance. And the way I frame this challenge is um, can we do something, Andrea, about the title? You know, the titles are all hidden here, so you can't see the title. Uh, so it's something about Western hegemony and regime design. design. Regimes, of all sorts of regimes in the world that uh, are always have, have the same problem. Because they were designed at a, mo at a certain moment of power asymmetry in the world, they were designed to to actually serve some interests more than others. Not so egregiously that people wouldn't sign up to it, countries wouldn't sign up, but my major asymmetries. And these asymmetries can always be framed in the frame of, you know, is this really, isn't that basically about the structure of global capitalism and its proxies? Uh, again, I'm not gonna enter this debate, but I don't wanna enter a conversation about democracy in the world without putting on the table the structure of capitalism, which itself uh, embeds power relations of wealth and political power that then design and, and create these asymmetric burdens, right? So with that as a background then, uh, I just want to put on the table then a few of the frames that we've used to think about this conceptually from an IR viewpoint. Um, and one, the first frame here, and that's kind of the entry of the paper that you have, is to say, look, in Europe, you have to deal with all these asymmetries. You have this differentiated integration, differentiated cooperation, different states cooperate on different topics with serving different interests domestically. And this differentiation kind of deals, tries to deal with these different interests. And the EU does this internally, but it also does this externally, uh, whether it's close neighbors like Norway or whether it's with more faraway neighbors. But the question that we've asked and I've asked and with our group of researchers have asked here is, well, how, how about using this, what we've learned about EU schemes of cooperation to deal with these differentiated burdens uh, and apply it to the global system? 
it's a different lens on a lot of things we've all long said of in IR about global governance. So, um, so we compare the EU to the overall global system. And here, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but just to note that I'm using as a frame a relational approach to power in the paper, uh, which of course is a whole new body of literature in IR, which starts from the fact that ontologically, you start with relationships rather than characterizing units, whether they're countries or uh, regional groupings. You worry about the relationship. And I'll show you in a minute how that translates then uh, in terms of characterizing these relationships. So, I mean, there's much to say about the relational theory. All of this is in the paper, so I don't need to go over it. Uh, you can go back to it. So yeah, there are many, many slides, okay. And then the other bit to put, so, so you know where I'm coming from. Some of you know my work on decentering from Eurocentrism, from Western centrism. How do we decenter IR? How do we provincialize what, what we do, what, what happens in our bits of the world? How do we engage with the rest of the world, even almost as if we didn't exist? And then reconstruct what should be our approach. And in this case, I'm specifically concerned with what Europe is gonna do, and maybe the US, but the, the so-called North, uh, in working on re transforming, transforming transnational governance, you know what? How should we reconstruct this? So, you know, our start. The starting point is that there is always a core, re you know, problem: democratic balance in the world. When countries relate between uh, the need, the interference, interference in each other's affairs, formally or informally which can be either domination or solidarity. I mean, there's a spectrum there, the good and the bad to simplify. But at the same time, of course, what is sovereignty? What is the system? The, Jennifer writes beautifully uh, on, on sovereignty as responsibility. Well, we look at each other, we defer, and we give each other autonomy, but is it autonomy or is it indifference when you should inter? So again, interference and deference as the core frame of this story. Now. That's the challenge. How do you find the right balance that serves a certain understanding of fairness, justice, and indeed autonomy and self-determination? So the paper and part of the our whole project starts with the need to address the, what we call democratic okay. concurrence. Hello? Is there a, no? Okay, there's an echo here. Maybe somebody doesn't like what I'm saying. And of course, in democratic inconvenience, okay. the angle of democracy in this whole story is not what we usually talk, you know, when we talk democracy and global governance, yes, there is a whole topic about UN and who takes decisions and who sits in the UN Security Council. Well, that's not what we're talking about today. What we're talking about is democratic interdependence. How our democracies affect each other. It's, it's all part of the same big picture, but it's a different angle, right? And this, what we mean by incongruence is the dysfunction simply between those who take decisions and are affected by them, rule accountability and rule applicability. Um, so the question is, then there, of course there's gonna be incongruence. You know, there's interdependence, it happens, shit happens in the world. The question is when does democratic interdependence um, and therefore the incongruence that's come from it becomes domination. Uh, and then what we say, and, and John Eric will say more about this, is that the complex, uh, the, we shouldn't throw um, out this complex system that creates interference uh, with the specter of domination. Yes, there is a risk we will dominate each other when we integrate, it, relate to each other, and but uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't, right? So in EU 3D, we articulate this concern about in terms of domination, which comes to us from Republican political philosophy. But of course, when you take it to the international, uh, an undominated state uh, means, of course, a fair scheme of cooperation. How do you cooperate in, in when there are huge asymmetries between the big guys and the little guys in this world? even more than domestically to some extent for reasons we can go into. Um, so how do we think about that? Um, and of course we can define uh, democratic autonomy, our lodestar. Um, um, which basically 
is when you keep uh, uh, countries from meeting their obligation to own publics and for publics to co-author their destiny, their rules and everything else. Um, and so the meaning of domination is not just between state, representative, regulators, but all the way down, the extent to which it affects the capacity of citizens to, uh, to enter their polities in as equal subjects. So importantly, not all forms of power, symmetries, and influence qualify as dominance. First of all, you need to ask what is at stake? Are these really core values, basic needs, et cetera? And you need to ask under what conditions are there strategy to mitigate this risk of dominance? And that's really, you know, the, the paper then goes into all of these things. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about strategies to mitigate uh, democratic dominance when, you know, the EU, uh, in this case from the EU, but it can be from the US, uh, promotes its own regulatory uh, rules, the Brussels effect, or has all sorts of promotion, uh, or has, you know, privacy laws on the digital, uh, on the web, or, and then the North has weaponized its interdependence because it controls financial markets. So you all have examples in your, in your mind, or indeed when the West decides on a sanction regime, which has huge externalities on the rest of the world. We all, all of our countries do things and act, and these have implications. And so here are four strategies, and I'm just going to go through the first three. But the first is, has to do with, well, you decide what, whichever country or group of country in a non-arbitrary way. How, how do you internalize, how do you consider in your decision making the interests of others? This is the very classic, the other regarding this. And but then, of course, there are all sorts of strategies of authorship in each other's polity. And the EU does some of it, the, and you can call it foreign interference. In fact, today there is a committee meeting in the French Parliament on foreign interference. We have our Edmo program here. So when is it? When is uh, how others uh, take part in your decision as a polity? Uh, say the Global South, uh, you know, sends representative in uh, the European um, uh, decisions in the European Parliament and talks to committees about the externality of sanctions. When is that for an interference? And when is that the ability of others to co-author your rule when you have your a stakeholder, you're affected by these rules? Okay, but these are difficult questions. Or three, agency. How much agency, that's elements of deference. How much do you actually create ways in which others can uh, still relate to you, but elude, escape your rules if they don't correspond to their interest and without punishing them for it. So these are kind of strategies and I know that I don't have much time left and um, so I'm going pretty fast, but I, we can come back with examples on all of these. Um, and in the paper, um, Another important distinction is that, okay, you always have insiders and outsiders when rules are made in the system. And you also have a very important distinction in the world between horizontal dominance, bigger state dominating smaller states, and within them bigger interest groups, versus vertical dominance when sovereignty is pooled and the common regime with all its own power symmetry dominates uh, those who are members, um, how those two co co um, are connected. So in the paper, there's some discussions about how these relate, but basically you, what you always want to guard against is from both viewpoints uh, is indeed those two types of domination. So, uh, and then I have other conclusions. Now, to close then, this is kind of the paraphernalia, the, the pillars of the reasoning about democratic interdependence. Now, on that basis then, uh, I developed this kind of two by two method, method typologies. Somebody's, maybe we, oops. And I just want to say a word about it. So if we, if we consider all of these risks of democratic attrition, of affecting each other's polity, and of course, this is not assuming the whole world is democratic. No country is 
a pure democracy or even anywhere close to it. So, you know, it's a question of differential. You have polities and you have democratic autonomy or autonomy to court and how we affect, uh, these are affected. Now, take all of this, come to this, to, to the idea that in the world, we have different ways of cooperating which affect our democratic autonomy or autonomy as polity differently. And here um, I distinguish between symmetric and asymmetric relations. And the idea that the mode of how we, how we uh, differentiate between obligations and benefits will be either decided by a few who will be gatekeepers, and that is the kind of post-colonial trope, or it will be decided by all, and that's endogenous, right? And so in the, it, it, this scheme then leads us to uh, have four categories. And basically, as we move through these categories, I think this is, we are moving, this is not just a static, but normatively towards the fourth, which in a way is an enhancement of democracy. Uh, actually, the first two are really, in fact, um, uh, the, the you have in a symmetric world or all countries uh, enter an international system through various modes of recognition that have been de decided uh, that are symmetric, but that's still part of an exogenous system. But we live in a world of club right now and the EU and the North still operates this way where the principal way of doing international relations is selection, asymmetric, exogenously decided by a club and with asymmetric power selecting who is in, who is out, who will benefit, who will not on different terms. And in fact, the clubs on Greece, CBAM, for instance, the EU, all of the regional clubs are this way, the G7, every club uh, in the world, as well as their external policies. So what we do have alternatively is to have progressively endogenized, and so the rulemaking is collective, where you endogenize regime and then you distinguish between different status. Like in WTO, you have different obligations for develop, less develop, or in other regimes in the uh, same thing. But where, what we, where we are do, going with the green, uh, uh, with the cup system and other adjacent regime to some extent in migration, but that's not really working, uh, is to go from distinction to discretion where actually everybody has a symmetric co contribution to deciding what they're gonna do under the gaze of everybody else. So all affected becomes the table. It becomes all countries deciding together, you know, what your contribution to, to climate, um, to CO2 emissions will be. And, um, and increasingly then that allows for modes of cooperation, which Tom Hales has co called catalytic cooperation, which are increasingly polycentric and decentralized. Now I have a whole other set of slides that kind of talks about polycentricity and democracy and this polycentricity, but I'm gonna leave that for the discussion because I'm just putting here some concepts on the table and then we can move forward. Right, well, this was uh, some very, very quick 13 minutes uh, after the intro. So I'm sorry to have been fast and hello, Liz. Uh, <laughs> well, we, you won't, we won't go to you first. Um, now, I would like to suggest that we have a very short beginning of conversation now here, and then we move on, uh, Franca, because or else it will be too much, you know. Um, does that work for you? Yeah. Okay. And I'm happy to go back to, to um, any concepts. Yeah, we can, we can, yeah, there were some arrows. There. Okay. Right. These are, afterwards I have many examples, but you know, we'll... Okay. Philip. Well, I'm surprised, not surprised, but at a certain coincidence, but let me just call your attention to another literature but which deals with some of these same problems. 
And believe it or not, all of this was inspired by a single sentence of a Norwegian colleague of yours, Stein Rokan. And at some point, Stein said, votes in Norway, votes are counted, interests are weighed. And the literature, he didn't refer to it, but it can be traced back to some guy by the name of Johannes Althusius, and it's called consociationalism. And the basic idea is that all forms of government, whether autocratic or democratic, depend on numbers and on intensities of preference. So what I'm hearing here is how do you balance in a consociational regime? And the famous cases are these ones that God, Lembrook and, 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 and Aaron Leipart, it's all of those national regimes were described as consociational democracies in which you have then these pillars of unequal size. And therefore the central problem is domination because one of those pillars usually class, but also religion or language is larger than the other. So how do you avoid, let's say in Switzerland, two thirds of the population is Ger speaks German and the one third that the remains speak three other, well, really only two, but so how do you deal with those kind of, so I'm saying there's a very extensive literature on this at the national level. What I've tried to do in these papers is to project this to the, you call and it And that's what we level. all try to do, but. So I just, I just yeah. ask you to think in terms of weighting of intensities. What are the devices that have been developed at the national level, but can be easily, I think, projected beyond that to weigh intensities. And part of them are rather similar to the ones you come up with, right? But I'm just calling your attention to the fact that this is by no means of course, a new of course, I mean, issue. I mean, it's been <laughs> dealt with for a long, long time in somewhat different terms, however. So think in terms of counting as opposing as opposed to weighting intensities counting numbers so i think we're going to come back to the whole federal scheme and all this in the second session with because john eric's papers and That's i can't exactly keep... the mistake it's not federalism yeah. you're missing the okay point entirely. sorry philip because okay. i i also <laughs> made a bit of a small mistake because we do have um designed the the program as roundtable kickoff and and i'm kind of feeling that um we because we started a bit late etc maybe we should uh respect the the order of the rather than opening it up right now because it might actually be a bit confusing um so i mean john eric you're my co now you're chairing this session <laughs> should we um should we have franka present and then the the three discussions and then open up, would that make more sense? Yeah, yeah. we'll come back to your question yeah. too, Philip, because it yeah. is a fundamental question and it pertains to the whole workshop. So we will. So, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm reversing, reverting to the traditional way of th doing things and Franca, yeah. Why don't we have Franca who, uh, she doesn't need to be introduced here. And in fact, you can introduce yourself, but you're finishing your PhD and <laughs> kind of, uh, and, uh, and have, and been a very wonderful co-conspirator in everything EU we've done since I've been here with Ponte Europa and working with uh, the whole wonderful team of researchers here. So it's lovely to hear you, Franca. Thank you, Calypso. Lovely to be here. So yes, uh, maybe just for those who don't know me, I'm a PhD researcher here at the UI in my third year at the law department, um, but working in a quite interdisciplinary manner on, uh, on matters EU, EU democracy related, I would say. Uh, and in particular, I'm working with the concept of militant democracy. Um, and I would like to take that today um, to approach some of the questions that we will be discussing today and tomorrow during this workshop. And in particular, um, regarding what characterizes the EU as a transnational democracy as one example or one instance of transnational democracy. What are the challenges and, and opportunities that it faces? And um, 
maybe just a short definition um, of militant democracy for those who are not familiar with the concept. It is essentially um, a particular form of, of democratic self-defense. I would say it's the, the rights restrictive self-defense of a democratic polity. Um, rights restrictive meaning restricting rights of um, freedoms of association, speech, assembly, um, political rights, essentially core democratic rights in order to prevent that the democratic polity is being eroded from within, essentially. So um, militant democracy is a rather state-centric concept, I would say. It's mostly known for or associated with phenomena like the party ban at the national level, or kind of national level democracies countering is extremist political actors through those rights restrictions. But in the last years, also threats to um, democratic principles have arisen at the EU level. So I would like to apply today the concept of militant democracy to the EU, not kind of as a practical blueprint for action, but what the EU should do about, let's say, democratic backsliding or rather democratic dismantling. I don't like the, the passive phrasing of, of it, um, but more with regard to what it tells us, the concept of militant democracy, about, well, challenges or the concept of democratic self-defense, more broadly speaking, and also about the nature of the EU itself as a transnational polity. And I would like to make four main points. Um, the three first ones are um, about, let's say, tensions or differences between national and EU militant democracy. And the fourth one is sort of normative or democratic challenge that is cutting across both national and EU militant democracy. Um, the first point pertains to something that you could maybe call um, an implicit sort of normative truism of the concept of militant democracy. And that is that, well, a militant democracy needs to be democratic. It needs to be democracy. Right. Um, and that might seem a matter of course and was surprisingly not much questioned or discussed in the concept of national militant democracy. But now when we apply the concept to the EU, it becomes a bit ambiguous, of course. I mean, um, we're all familiar with with the academic and practical debates about the EU's democratic deficit. Um, is the EU democratic? Is it democratic enough? Is democracy kind of the legitimizing principle through which to approach the EU to begin with? And also in the political discourse, I think of the EU taking, taking action against democracy dismantling member states, um, this, this theme of the EU sitting in a glass house has been coming up or shining through time and again, right? Uh, along the lines of whom are you to, to tell us what to do or, or punishing us for not respecting principles that well, you don't have the best record on yourself, EU, in a way. And the requirement or, or the demand of a militant democracy being democratic is, is of course, a key normative demand. And that, that brings us to the theme of domination, which we will discuss in this workshop, because if a non-democratic polity engages in, in these instruments, um, it by default becomes a form of arbitrary domination and, and cannot be legitimized. But I think at the same time, there's a nuance here because the EU shows us also the danger to stylize what does it mean to, to be democratic. Um, and we easily get towards this idea of a perfect democracy, which Calypso has kind of implicitly touched upon and, and, and criticized already, right? And why, why is that? Well, if we say the EU is not democratic, it's not democratic enough, and therefore it may not defend democratic principles, we kind of get towards a paradoxical vicious circle because then having to, to observe or condone the, the erosion of democratic principles simultaneously erodes the basis for democratic reforms, kind of much needed democratic reforms, or prevents them from, from arising through democratic means themselves. So I would say rather the, the challenge or the question here for any necessarily imperfect real world democracy 
is how to stand firm in the defense of democratic principles, all whilst at the same time having mechanisms and, mechanisms and ways in place to prevent the abuse of democratic self-defense and kind of democratic self-defense lapsing into a petrification of the status quo, because that will be deeply undemocratic in itself, right? If democratic self-defense becomes a form of demo domination by foreclosing the openness for democratic reform and democratic transformation kind of along the way. So that is, that is kind of the first point to set a bit the scene. And the second point is related in that militant democracy as a state-centric concept is intimately tied to coercive powers, to the idea of coercive powers and sovereignty. No way. Now, the EU as a non-sovereign polity does not have the power of the sort. And arguably, you could say that is one reason why um, actions against democracy dismantling member states have not been very effective in some regards. But recently, there is kind of a new tool um, which is becoming prominent in this regard on the EU level, and that is that of financial conditionality. So what we see a bit at the EU level is the power of the sort being replaced by the power of the purse, which seems to be almost the most effective instrument by now. And there's, there's different normative takes one or perspectives one can take on that. I just want to kind of throw them out there without um, leaning to, to either side necessarily. On the one hand, you can criticize this phenomenon for being a form of buying compliance with values. There seems to be a contradiction here, maybe something that feels wrong about this, right? That there's no normative coherence between the, the principles or what is what is being sanctioned, what is what is being breached, and the nature of the sanction, which is the one being on a kind of on a, on a moral level, the other one being very technical and financial. On the other hand, you might also say, well, maybe that's not a bad thing. Maybe it's good that there is no normative li link between the breach and the sanction, in that. It avoids the democratic dilemma, um, a much decried theme in, in militant democracy theory, that it is paradoxical and undemocratic in itself to restrict political participation rights in the name of democracy. So maybe there is a form of, in that sense, at, at, at a second sight, more coherent democratic self-defense emerging at the transnational level be it only um, as a out of the leg of, of better or, or different means, uh, out of the leg of the sort, resorting to the purse, it might be even more legitimate in that than militant democracy does not take the form of restricting fundamental rights. My third point is also related to this lack of sovereignty and of coercive powers. Now, as you know, the EU can, under its current legal framework, not expulse a member state. And that has been very much criticized by, by certain academic commentaries. I, I don't want to go into the debate now whether this is good or bad, um, or whether the EU should be able to do that. But rather, I want to look at what are the consequences of the fact that it cannot currently expulse a member state for democratic self-defense as it takes place currently under the EU legal order. And what we see then is that, again, maybe out of necessity, many instruments of EU militant democracy have, have a remedial character, as I would call it. So financial conditionality, infringement proceedings, monitoring and, and evaluation under the rule of law mechanisms. And all these instruments, the goal is not merely to sanction in a way, but to put an end to the breach as soon as possible and kind of keep the member state on board or get the member state back on the democratic principles board, if you so want. And that is very different actually from national militant democracy. A party ban is for instance, deeply exclusionary. And the goal is not to keep constituents political actors on, on board and within the democratic community, but it's firmly to say like, okay, no, this is where we draw the line. 
and also in most of, of, the, of the cases, in most countries at the national level, there's no possibility for lifting those bans. Whereas in the EU, with financial conditionality, it can be lifted. That's part of the very idea. Infringement procedure sanctions are only until the breach has been remedied. And in that regard, militant democracy in the EU is in a way less antagonistic and more inclusive than at the national level. At the expense of effectiveness, you could argue, perhaps, but I think it's it's interesting to, to think about it this way. And, um, and then my last point is about a normative challenge for national and transnational militant democracy alike. Because militant democracy, as I said, it's a rights restrictive and it's also a legal institutional kind of top-down way of defending democracy. So from a democratic theory perspective, the way it's practiced, it's not really by the people for the people, right? Courts typically play a central role in spelling out what are the democratic principles which can lead to de facto political exclusion from the polity. Um, and in the EU, for instance, core principles like the rule of law or, or democracy itself are spelled out in a very institutionalist and kind of formalistic way. And it's based on this understanding also then that they're enforced. And in this regard, Jan Werner Müller has brought up an interesting question recently, which is why not have a deliberative citizens assembly for spelling out what we consider defense worth, worthy within a democratic community and for when and how to defend democratic principles. And I would think it's arguably this, this type of issues, the, the deeply divisive moral issues in a society where a citizen assembly can really add and is really needed to enhance democratic governance on, on all levels, really. That's, that's what I mean with it. it's, it's a normative challenge cutting across the national and the transnational. And uh, I think here, uh, a citizens' assembly, which we will probably come back to this, this theme and maybe also this form of democracy would be much more, much more powerful, much more suitable than for kind of not very controversial issues. I just come from Brussels having observed the citizens' panel on learning mobility. Well, I think that the real juice is, is on topics like this, like democratic principles and, and what, what to do to defend them. And why not subject that to a citizens' assembly? I'm uh, curious to hear your, your views on, on these themes and looking forward to discussing in the next days. Thank you. Thank you. I'm chairing now since Calypso is presenting. So we'll move on to the uh, other members of the uh, roundtable with Elizabeth Maloba first, please. Good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Maloba, and I am a policy leader fellow at the School of Transnational Governance. I'm not so much an IR scholar as an IR practitioner. I work in development cooperation and international cooperation, um, supporting a lot of collaboration processes in Africa and yeah, trying to see how that translates. I'm here to see how that translates into a global governance frame. Um, I would say um, a lot of both, it's a both, and so a lot of what Calypso says, but a lot of what you also say resonates a lot with me. I like that Philip already brought up for me what the Norwegians do. So we count the numbers, but we weigh the interests. And this is a very interesting dichotomy. But I think for me, I take it from a systems approach. I come into this conversation from a systems approach. And I normally like to think about it and say in 1945, following the two world wars, because there was one world war, an attempt to create peace, this failed, another world war, and then a second attempt to create peace. The people making peace at that time created peace in the image that they had in their minds. And therefore we have a model that relies on state to state interaction and that calls on states to relate with other states to, to create a global governance system, um, which reflects then in the structures because we started with the first structure being the United Nations. So we have a lot of for, similar to the United Nations formal institutions. So the UN, but also 
um, the Bretton Woods institutions, these are all governed by various uh, treaties. And then we have informal ones um, and we have ad hoc ones, but they're all intergovernmental relations. There's really no um, structure per se that goes beyond that. And recent trends have been to have a lot of consultative and inclusive processes that include private sector, that include civil society, but the effort has been more like try and widen the tent without really what does that mean for the system. So if the model was state to state, the institutional framework worked. But if the model goes beyond state to state and starts to include civil society, starts to include private sector, what does that mean? And also to look beyond the big buckets, because when we say private sector, um, it's a big, big difference to say Amazon, which is a multinational corporation, versus to say uh, Atabekeria in, in Florence, which is also a private sector entity, but that's such a different kind of uh, private sector entity there for different interests. And the same with civil society. I think in the development world, we're having a very big debate about what uh, international NGOs do versus what local NGOs do. And we have even differentiated local NGOs and civil society, uh, community-based organizations. It's, it's all complex, but it's beginning to say that there is much more complexity around where the relationships are happening and how they are happening. And it's no longer just a state-to-state -state system. And so over time, and a lot of things have changed since 1945. That's one aspect that has changed. The other aspect that has changed is the number of states that we have in the system. So in 1945, I don't know, I can't remember how many there were, but there were very few states. Now we have a hundred and something states sitting around the table. And I believe I come from the part of the world where we are really um, fighting for increased agency, increased visibility, a seat at the table, my ambassador recently actually said in, in, in New York, if we're not at the table, we are on the menu. And this is really a big uh, topic for us uh, coming from Africa. We do not, we no longer want to be at the menu, but then the question becomes, how do we change the model of interaction so that we remove the privileges that were built into the system in 1945, without destabilizing the system enough. And especially for us, because again, this tends to be the only place where we have a voice. If we go to the ad hoc organizations like the G7 and the G20, then our voice completely disappears. So the UN still remains kind of our best um, place to have a voice, but we don't know how to transform it. Um, I would... Maybe stop there, except to mention one thing that I always keep in my mind, which um, this I got from my dad. He always tells me if anything was made by a person, people can change it. So I always come into this discussion and say the global transnational governance system was made by human beings. It will take human beings to change this system, but we do need to change it beyond. One of my biggest frustrations is when I sit sometimes in some forums and listen to transformation conversations. And it's very much, oh, what is the relevance of Europe in this conversation? I'm like, there's more than Europe. It would be nice if we discussed how do we situate all the different players within this system? So that it's not just where is Europe, but then where is Latin America? Where is Africa? Where is Asia? What are the different dynamics? And where are the points where we can begin to make changes that would change the overall system. I think I'm going to step, stop there and then I'd be happy to take questions. And thank you for this um, point on weighing interests. It would be a, it would be a, a refrain through the <laughs> event. Your, your note there, Philip. Um, we move on to um, Olivia, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Olivier de France. I am a Darren Wolf Scholar at the European Studies Centre at St. Anthony's, one of Calypso's uh, homelands, one of your alma, alma maters. Uh, and if there is one thing you need to know about me is that I'm an extremely um, impolite guest. 
So if you invite me to your home, I'm saying this because Pavel was here and he lives in a magnificent village in the south of France. I'm fishing for an invitation. So just to warn you, I, I'm a very impolite guest. And so I will um, dig through your library and probably do so before dinner. And uh, Calypso made the rookie mistake of inviting me to stay at her home this week. So obviously this is what um, I did. And this is where I drew some inspiration for the, for the few points I want to make. Today I found, for example, the uh, um, the collective volume to which Calypso partook called the European Constitutional Imaginaries, um, which she gifted me, and I'm very thankful for that. I also find some of Tony Negri and uh, Michael Hart's work on, uh, you know, the multitude and the assembly. And this inspires me to really, you know, make a... My argument is essentially for a, a properly three-dimensional theory of uh, European of European politics, insofar as the discipline of international relations is a very, in a way, primitive discipline. It's a very one-dimensional discipline, insofar as we understand, like global actors, based on you know an idea of the planet, which is essentially a chessboard, you know, this metaphor, this continuing metaphor that we still think of today, of the planet as a chessboard in which, on, upon which we have pieces in which the, uh, you know, the squares of the chessboard are external to one another, partes extra partis, as you would say in Latin, there is no overlap. They are external to each other and crucially they are flat. There is no profundity and the planet is not exactly uh, is not exactly a chessboard. And if, if you truly want to do it in three dimensions, I think this is how this is where you want to this is where you want to start. Uh, it's actually also the same in EU studies. And uh, I think when we look at Europe, it can also be uh, fairly one dimensional. And this is why looking at imagine like constitu constitutional imagine imaginaries and imagined communities is actually is actually a good way to go about it. Uh, I think, uh, it, with regard to, to uh, Calypso's paper, the thing I wanted to uh, to comment on is I think the relational bit. I sorry, it might be it's, it's going to be a tiny bit theoretical, but on on the relational bit per se, what I would what I would go for is not just uh, to take relational theory as a lens through which to see differentiated integration, but actually go all the way and uh, and actually try to set out a you know a, a, a fully relational and three-dimensional theory of European politics the the, the, the trouble of course is uh, as Calypso says uh, there are many relational theories as there are relational thinkers but I think the basic definition that we can all kind of agree upon is to say that relational thinking looks uh, primarily at constituent relations as opposed to the actors. Uh, we basically start from the from the relationships, from the relations, as opposed to the things or the entities which they put into uh, into contact. So from there, if that's the, just the, the kind of basic corpus of, uh, of agreement, I want to you know set out a very embryonic kind of three dimensional um, relational theory. The first is the the horizontal the horizontal dimension. Um, this is what uh, Hart and Negri and um, and Calypso also in this chapter you we call the the multitude or the public. Um, when we when we see when we think about the public sphere in Europe, we tend to we have a very kind of a rational view of it. It's basically sharing ideas, but perhaps we could also go for something a tiny bit more uh, embodied and living and breathing. Uh, for example, I I invite you to. I think Pavel will say a few words about this maybe tomorrow about the European sentiment compass, right? Which is a kind of, you know, it's not a European public sphere in a way. It's a European living and breathing body of citizens who have affects and emotions and who see the outside based uh, based, based on all this. The trouble is this horizontal uh, relational di dimension, which is also, I think, in the literature, which uh, uh, Nixon and Jackson talk about, for example, um, in, their, in their foundational article about relational theories of Europe. Um, and actually, Hart and Negri talk about in the same way, this horizontal dimension 
never really takes in, into account the vertical dimension. So basically the multitude, the power of the people is always seen as positive and the vertical dimension of basically constituted power as opposed to constituent power or the institution uh, as opposed to the forces that constitute it, the institutions are always seen as negative, as, as basically a form of domination, right? So whenever we create an institution, by definition, this will be a form of, of domination. And I think this is incorrect. I think that um, there is a way of thinking of uh, constituted power and institutions, which is essentially liberating, emancipating, as opposed to, to dominating. But for this, I think we need to go back to the kind of foundations. And this is in my, just my opinion, but the go back to the foundations of kind of early modern European political thought, where these debates actually uh, were already all the rage, if you were. Um, in, for example, a discussion, uh, well, a written discussion, really, between uh, between Hobbes between Hobbes and Spinoza. At the time, there was already a kind of um, a way of, of trying to think of the relationship between these two dimensions of power, the horizontal dimension and the vertical dimension, uh, which at the time you would uh, obviously use uh, two Latin words. The horizontal one was potentia, which is where Hart and Negri took the potentia multitudinis, which is a phrase that is from Spinoza's uh, political uh, treaties. And that is what they call the, the, the power of the people, the power of the multitude, right? There is a second concept, which is a vertical concept, is potestas, which is the constituted power, which is essentially the, the institution. Now, for there's a, there's, a, there's a different way in which early modern Europe thinks about this, which uh, is actually you know, early modern Europe is far more similar than we think to the, to the 21st century. In, for example, in Hobbes's concept of monarchy, which he's conceived of as the best political form, he thinks of monarchy as the, le, 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 sorry, the Leviathan, as basically the universal solution to the uh, problem of political order, right? Whereas Spinoza, in his work, basically argues for democracy, which is a form of vertical power, which in his uh, political philosophy allows for uh, the autonomization, the emancipation, the collective autonomy of, uh, of, of the people, right? Um, and it's only vertical in so far as, if you like, the institution is only an open process of institutionalization. And what I've heard uh, today at the beginning of this seminar, the Citizens' Assembly seems to me uh, something like that, an open, an open process of, of institutionalization. If we go back to the more contemporary literature, I mean, uh, in, in Calypso's paper, you cite um, Deleuze and Guattari and the difference in repetition. Uh, actually, in Difference and uh, Repetition, which was 1968, Deleuze and Guattari make the difference between differentiation with a T and differentiation with a C. Uh, differentiation, differentiation with a with a T is essentially all the virtual forms of how you can take a, an op, uh, a whole, a bounded community and open it, and all the virtual possibilities that there are in there. And differentiation with a C is how that is actualized in um, how that's actualized in reality. And I think in there, in that, in that specific kind of tension is where you can actually draw, uh, well, the third dimension, right? Not just the horizontal or the vertical, but in a way, the, the diagonal. So how do you take the, um, vertical and the horizontal to create a three-dimensional, uh, theory of European, of European politics in Hart and Negri, we were talking about this yesterday, uh, They've they found quite a nifty way of of defining these two dimensions. Um, they call power with a big P, with a, a capital P, the institutional power, the 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 constituted power, and power with a small P, the constitu the constituent power. So the so the power of popular of of popular politics. This is a neat way in English to say pouvoir et puissance, because in front in in French the word you can distinguish it within the word power the the pouvoir and the puissance and in political philosophy you could say yeah I, I'll, I'll finish there in in political philosophy you can use puissance for the horizontal version of power and pouvoir for the vertical 
And so essentially the question is, how do you find the third way or the, th the, the three dimensional? Uh, and I think Calypso's concept, for example, of uh, citizen power Europe is, is one way to do it. Um, and if you want to start there, then again, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm advertising uh, Pavel's few comments tomorrow on the on this on the citizen sentiment compass a citizen power Europe based on how uh, the citizens view the world order view um, view the global order I think is the place to start so no pressure no pressure Pavel thank you very much and now for the last comment by Stefano Merlo who is uh, has a virtual presence and um, I think you can see him on the screen yeah, I hope you can uh, hear me well as well. Um, thank you so much for having me. My, my name is Stefan. I'm a lecturer at UCL. Um, and I'm working mainly on republicanism. Um, so my comments will be brief. Um, and I will try to do two things. First of all, it will be to say how scared I am of the paper that uh, Reuven, Adrian and I contributed and helped Calypso put together. Uh, because it goes to the core of um, my anxiety towards republicanism, because it's a wonderful theory um, that is very, very hard to apply in practice. And I feel Calypso had had the courage to actually take the challenge head on. Um, and I'll tell you a couple of reasons why I feel republicanism is both incredibly useful and very hard to uh, express and be ultimately action guiding. Um, and the reason actually connects with, with what um, a previous discussant mentioned, which is the fact that by creating institutions in order to reduce the arbitrariness, um, we might end up actually creating more arbitrariness. And I think the differentiated integration is, it sits exactly at the center of this question. What kind of institutions create versus reduce arbitrariness? And uh, the reason why I'm scared of, of the paper, in a sense, um, is that it has to grapple with different understanding of arbitrariness. Um, so there might be the arbitrariness that comes from the discretion. So Pettit is very, very clear that Politicians shouldn't even, even have discretion because that's the paradigmatic example of an external will. But then there's also the notion of arbitrariness as rules, you know. So if you think about a system of slavery, um, people are enforcing it, but arguably it's this system, this very fixed uh, structure that creates the arbitrariness and the unfairness. So I think um, Calypso's work has managed to kind of tackle uh, this question of institution and arbitrariness um, and apply it in a, in a particularly clever way. Now, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm probably biased in this uh, discussion because, uh, of course, we, we helped, we try and helped uh, analysis. Um, so let me maybe perhaps say a couple of things that hopefully also connect what we've heard so far. Um, I have, I've, I've put down some notes before logging in, but then based on what I've heard, I think that there's some common denominators. Um, and it could be also a good way of using these concepts of differentiated integration. So Franca, for instance, mentioned financial conditionality and Elizabeth uh, highlighted how the structure, the regimes, the IR uh, regime that we've, that we've had so far are very intergovernmental. And I feel like the common denominator here could be, for instance, the topic of sovereign debt sustainability as one of those cases in which the sovereignty of a country gets put into question the most. And I feel like in the next 20 years, especially in developed for developing countries, this will be a question that will be at the forefront. If you think of Sri Lanka these days. Um, and the reason why I'm mentioning this specific example, apart from my professional deformation, because it's going to be on kind of the next project that I have in front, is that this is one of the key areas that goes to the core of a country's sovereignty, the ability to finance expenditure and be there for their citizens, and also the ones that internationally has the least amount of regulation and institutionalization. So I think this kind of 
policy area, this is just mine, one that came to mind, but there are surely many others, is one in which the paper that Calypso uh, uh, wrote and that we helped produce, the insights in that paper could help us say something about these very low level uh, of institutionalization kind of domains. Um, and so let me conclude by saying that when it comes to finding out whether the arbitrariness and where it lies and how to reduce it, um, then having these practical examples in mind becomes very, very helpful. So I really hope that as part of this conversation that we're having today, we can all bring in and tease out um, through examples these dimensions of arbitrariness. Uh, I don't want to take any more space because I feel like we've all had um, so much to, to, to think about in these four different intervention. Um, and I'm going to be uh, silently listening to, to some of these points and take some extra notes. So thank you very much. So can we allow Calypso to come back quickly then? And then we open up completely. Hmm? Um. I mean, just very quickly, I would like to emphasize, I mean, thank you for all these great comments. Uh, and indeed, it's lovely to see you, St Stefano, on screen, uh, as well as Adrian here. Um, it's a great team, as, as I said at the very beginning. Um, and I would like to emphasize the word horizontality here. What happens in horizontal connection? Because Liz was right to remind us, you know, what happened in the in the post-war and, and how uh, the global south or so many so many countries in the world want a voice around the table but here we are kind of saying that in a way a kind of a hegelian or condition of possibility of something happening at the global level is that we have a voice in each other's tables before thinking about the global table um, and what we do on each other's tables is indeed protect against what stefano just said arbitrariness because we have an impact what we do at our table has an impact on others tables and our tables overlap as it were so when the chinese or europeans or americans lend money to sri lanka it the way they think they they manage that money will have an impact on sri lanka the way the government of sri lanka then itself demonstrates that it itself is not arbitrary in taking in this money, but is democratic all the way down, will have an impact on the destiny of the Sri Lankans. Um, so, so basically, this is a story about neutrality. How in the world do we confront the impact of each other's arbitrariness or discretion? And what is the difference? Because we, we want to give each other as much discretion as possible, and it, it now becomes arbitrariness when there's no common rules to manage how we do it. And so this is where Frank has really important paper. I think, you know, we really want to try to integrate these stories because we have this story of militant democracy. Well, the EU is saying, look, we're going to try not to be arbitrary in how we manage our EU table at the regional level. There is this whole talk now in the EU about democratic resilience, hence the, the title of this of this workshop. How, how can we be resilient? Well, we have to have foundations here. We can't have weak links internally. I, I want to ask the question about whether, you know, what would happen if the UN was an instrument of militant democracy? So, you know, part of the exercise we try to do in this project, take the EU and then say, okay, now we have a huge risk of global government, global domination, in the name of militant democracy, what do you allow, not allow? On the other hand, you know, maybe that's what the U.S. wants to do with the summit of democracy. But what would it entail it's, is, a, is a question here. And so we come back then to, you know, Olivier and to, to, to Franca in that partly we want to try to organize through this vertical dimension. So it's horizontality is not just, well, people talking to each other. It has to be, we have to institutionalize the kind of empathy and mutual regardingness um, institutionalized empathy in, uh, at all levels. And this is where we need to recognize that the uh, inserting more democratic pathways in all of these interactions 
creates huge unpredictability, but unpredictability is the other word for democracy. This is something that you know, powers that be in this world don't really internalize very easily, that the definition of democracy is that it's unpredictable, it's unpredictable. Olivier said open. So open means it's open-ended. We don't know what will happen, but it's also open to each other. So there's a two sense of open, Olivier, I think that we want to stress in what you're saying. So if we try to think of a world, yes, citizen power Europe is the term I've used, but I'm thinking citizen power Africa. And of course, what we're seeing in the Sudan these days, you know, is in some ways, it's very much about the denial of obviously of citizen power. And how do we in, in the world empower, re-empower citizen power? Um, uh, and the key is to, try to engineer as we think of a transformed international order of how do we inform this order with citizens view of global order and this is what we're going to talk indeed about Pavel tomorrow um, but in all of this story it's all about how we can make this horizontal logic uh, of all sorts of differentiated integration not one of silos but, but inter, you know, polycentric. Um, and there are very, very concrete ways in which international organizations, um, as well as the external relations of states are to be reformed to do that. And that's what we'll continue to discuss, you know, in the next day and a um, um, half day. So maybe we can take more, more comments or Franca wants to jump in. Yeah, I, uh, I'd like Franca to come in too, since uh, you also presented, um, just as a small comment, would you say that the EU really qualifies as militant democracy in this, precisely for the arguments that you are listing? Because I think you make a very interesting case, but maybe that actually defeats the whole notion of militant for the EU, in the sense that what you are talking about here is more like a deliberative process. Um, and But there comes also some of the limitations of deliberation. If, if the buck doesn't stop after a process of deliberation, what happens then? Yeah, I think uh, there you just uh, put your finger in one of the normative wounds of, of militant democracy or the concept and the name. Um, the name is quite quite misleading, um, I would say, as uh, as a label or as a name for what is the normative idea behind it. And so indeed, I think that the term militant is a bit misleading, both in terms of like very concretely in the EU's case, what is the practice, but also about like when we approach the idea of democratic self-defense from a normative perspective, what it should be about, essentially, about in terms of what we what we are defending and how we are defending it. And, and this relates, I think, very much again to the theme of domination. And um just also from my from my perspective, from my research on militant democracy, what uh, Stefano said. Um, the, the question he brought up resonated very much with me. What kind of institutions create dominance versus what kind of institutions reduce it or arbitrariness rather, he was saying. And I think this is a big challenge that can be um, applied to any form of, of polity um, these days. The, the question of how to tackle domination, how to dismantle domination without at the same time institutionally creating more or new forms. Of, of domination. And I think the answer is far from intuitive. And um, it requires very much, I think, interdisciplinary um, perspectives on to kind of be able to, I can't say predict or, um, or identify the complex and often intersectional forms of domination which can arise. And that's something that we very much need to need to have in mind. I think um, I will I will leave it at that. I think um, because uh, we otherwise we don't have much time for discussion anymore. Well, I think we can uh, go a bit beyond four o'clock since we started late and so on. So uh, let's say that we keep it until uh, ten after four, and then we open up so that there will be a chance for other people also to comment on what has transpired. So now the floor is open, Pavel. Thanks a lot. Um, I feel I'm coming from here as a practitioner, and this is a way for me to say that there are plenty of words that I normally don't use and uh, sometimes don't don't fully understand. Uh, coming from a foreign policy think tank, I I felt uh, 
uh, that, that I grapple a lot with theoretical issues, but surely not to the to the extent that the, these are discussed uh, in the academia. So I, I just wanted to propose a case uh, which I would like to understand how the uh, various theoretical concepts that we have discussed, uh, how are they useful to discussing it? Uh, and the case uh, uh, is about how Europe is increasingly using trade to uh, to um, for the climate agenda. And uh, one of the um, one of the interpretations one one might have is that uh, since the Lisbon Treaty, the trade policy in the EU has become very much. Uh, more more democratic because, for example, European Parliament got a co-decision in that in that area, and this uh, uh, allowed for the public preferences to be channeled into the uh, trade policy, which used to be very much uh, like a silos uh, and a technical uh, uh, policy. It became mo much more politicized, and uh, there. It also increased a public pressure for the for this trade policy to also become useful for things that the the public increasingly uh, recognize as as challenges such as uh, such as climate, and this might be one of the reasons why today uh, European Union is using a lot of uh, using trade policy a lot to to to, to uh, yeah, deal with the climate challenge including through uh, solutions such as uh, uh, CBAM or deforestation uh, directive or, or some other uh, uh, laws, which uh, from the rest of the world uh, or for, from, from, from several countries outside Europe might be perceived as a form of domination because Europe is not uh, hesitating to introduce uh, policies which uh, others can reasonably interpret as form of protectionism and imposing solutions uh, on others. We tend to believe that the Brussels effect is something genuinely positive, but it's surely not from the perspective of those who, who are supposed uh, to follow the suit uh, uh, and uh, who's, who are, for example, have uh, economies that are very much uh, carbon intensive and as, as, a, as a result of, of, of European CBAM might find it much more difficult to export their, their uh, produce, whereas the WTO has not yet managed to uh, institutionalize that, that problem. And we are dealing with, with all of this in the context of the climate urgency. So the, for, for me, there is a, a strong normative question as to whether whether this is so so from it, it's it's bad in the sense that that institutions have not adapted yet to the uh, to the challenge and that uh, uh, and that Europe needs to break the rules in a way or potentially break those rules uh, uh, in order to get our way in in dealing with the climate cha uh, uh, challenge but one could also interpret it as as as, as a um uh, positive or, 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 or as, as a good behavior because uh, what what we need to bear in mind is the climate uh, urgency so i'm wondering how the the the, the, the theoretical aspects that you have uh, mentioned uh, would allow us to make sense of that complex issue thank you I mean, in some ways, the metaphor works really well because it's uh, for, with militant, because the EU is militant on green issue. And sometimes you go too far and there is a complacency. It's not just a normative problem. Oh, you should respect the democracy of others. Well, maybe to do the right thing, you should. It's not just normative. It is less effective than if you take in the democratic constraint is my democracy against your democracy or or at least intention with it. So when we, when the EU creates CBAMs, creates an external tariff for carbon intensive goods, um, in, it's, a, it's a pure, you know, in my matrix, it's a pure classic selection mechanism. The, the club addicts rules and then it imposes them through interdependence, weaponized interdependence of its own access to its own market, imposes them to the rest of the world. Um, but the problem is, you know, is, is that why is complacent not necessarily effective is that first of all, um, there is a degree of arbitrariness because you don't really know from the inside how a country 
uh, a actually addresses carbon dioxide. What about the groups that are that you may be disempowering that are doing their own thing in their own ways, maybe not with an emission trading system like the EU, which is the basis, it's a market-based way of assessing what other countries are doing. They might have other ways, but from your European way, you're saying, ah, we're going to get say if you're kosher or not on the basis of our own system and how close you are to our own system. Another, so there is the question of uh, how other regarding is the EU? And then how about authorship what role do we give the others in defining with us you know how how you should pass the test as it were um and it's the same for deforestation and for all of the green issues um as well as the agency they have so all of these labels that i gave you know in this matrix they're absolutely applicable to this case um and you know i'm a trade buff so if this is one area where i've totally applied this don't have time to go into this um, and the point is not to condemn all wholesale the EU or the US or that matter. I mean, big power applying their market power, their financial power uh, in order to do things externally is the extent to which they will, in doing so, exercise a, the kind of arbitrariness which actually undermines their own goal and the goal of global governance and the goal of fair development. Um, and that, that's what's at stake here. Because at the end of the day, effective policies anywhere else in the world is also based on ownership, not just by the voters of Brazil or Indonesia, or, but of groups, civil society groups, militant groups, indigenous groups, which the global north or the north with its power is not always able to take into account. So that's a very, thank you, Pavel, for giving this example, because I think it's a very you know, vivid and real, and Stefano was calling for real examples, um, and these are definitely very, very concrete. Um, hello, uh, I would like to pose a question to Franca, basically. Ah, sure. Mm -hmm. I think I might be more audible now, okay. Uh, so basically, um, uh, could you clarify the rationale or uh, the additional advantage of employing the liberal, deliberative citizens assemblies for the purposes of uh, militant democracy, let's say? So, because I see here that there might be some systematic or uh, institutional advantage in the sense that uh, we employ more people and uh, you say that military democracy is top down, or it might as well be a, a sub substantive advantage uh, so that they uh, employ more people having more views. Uh, but then uh, we need maybe to explore the practical problems of uh, employing citizens' assemblies, especially in the EU, that there is a kind of trans transnational governance. And um, in that sense, uh, would you say, for example, that the citizen panel that was discussing um, issues on democracy and rule of law in the Conference on the Future of Europe was a success or not? Or ca can we uh, apply that and is that corresponding to the rationale of um, militant democracy then? There's a lot in that question. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Um, yes, maybe to clarify a bit more um, the, the claim that I made or that I just put out there a bit that, you know, this, this might actually be a topic that is useful or that, that should be discussed through a citizens' assembly. It pertains very much to just the the principles which are at stake or which are in, in the name of which democracy is being defended through militant democracy instruments and what do they mean for a given democratic polity, right? And who at the moment gets to define them essentially? I can I can give you an example for what I don't continue, consider a democratic practice of militant democracy, which is, for instance, in Germany, um, the, the provision or the, the basis on which a party can be banned is if that party does not comply with the free democratic basic order. That is a concept which is not actually also written in the, the Constitution, and it's spelled out by the Constitutional Court in its case law through a non-exhaustive list of very abstract moral principles, all, all essentially contested concepts. And then that, in my view, threatens to become arbitrary, essentially, and that it's not 
So I, th I think it's important to have a, a democratic consensus or a, at least a, a debate at the core of what we are defending. And I think that for, for this, the Liberative Citizens Assemblies are an innovative and suitable forum in theory. Well, I, I am very aware of the practical challenges. I've been um, observing and a note taker at the Citizens Panel on Rule of Law and Democracy. And I think it was, yes, of course, it's, you, you cannot, yeah, I think it becomes very difficult now if we to, to kind of abstract from the the way in particular that the COFI or the citizens panels at the European level are organized at the moment to this this ideal type that, for instance, also certainly this proposal by Jan Werner Müller to have deliberative citizens assemblies discussing matters of militant democracy, it, that is quite a stretch at the moment because for now also what I what I said at the end of my presentation it seems that. The, the EU is choosing more or less deliberately, precisely the opposite type of topics or concepts for deliberative citizens assemblies, which are not so controversial and not polarizing and, and not exactly where deliberative citizens assemblies can have an added value. Like if you look at the second generation of the citizens panel now, food waste, learning mobility, I think it's broadly agreeable that that's a good thing. And then it becomes about the technical, how to implement it. And maybe there, then actually the, the citizens' panels are not best placed to do it. Whereas for setting the agenda, and in this case, for setting the, the democratic agenda and defining, you know, what, what are the principles we want to stand for, if need be through restrictive means, that would be, that would be for me a more, more suitable topic or a way to approach citizens' panels. But, uh, yeah, it seems that there's quite a gap at the moment between, between this and the, the current institutional approach to it, let's say. I hope that answers your question a little bit. Maybe a footnote to this. Um, the uh, citizens panels also are being coached by experts who provide the sort of the, the input to what are what is being deliberated, which brings in the question, should you front load or do you need to front load the normative issues or is that something that will emanate from the discussion itself? I think that this is, I think that's a general, issue for us here actually in, in the whole uh, debate and also actually for republicanism and I think I, I, I uh, share some of the, um, the, the, the uncertain at least uncertainty with republicanism in, in, in the sense that it doesn't come with very clear normative basic principles uh, up front at least Pettit and so on uh, has been quite ambiguous about this. Yeah. We just, yeah. yes, I'm adding a footnote too. I mean, before we even kind of quite, I mean, to situate citizens' assembly in this whole question of democracy and transnational governance, um, now part of the kind of the line that we're taking here is that horizontality matters. That if, if it's an European democracy, union of peoples who govern together, but not as one as I've defined it, it can be a global democracy, but it's never about creating one European people or one global people, uh, even in the UN uh, or whatever, uh, but it's intermingling our democracies. And if we do that, we need to go all the way down. Governments talk to each other, parliaments do, courts do, regulators, this, the, but peoples don't really, except for very far away or polarizing kind of media campaign. So part of the whole idea of citizens, their variations on citizens' involvement is that it can, um, at all levels, because there can be variable geometry, create much more conversations across borders. Now, why is this positive because we know that we know from research that these kinds of dynamics actually bring people to this to the uh means i mean there is a kind of de taking away from extremes in these in in these dynamics not always and there are up and and why is that because well you know the, the what is the biggest pathology of our democracies domestically and globally is capture capture of corporations capture of state power to start with um, the kind of the barbarian critique of then the pathology. And if you'd give more power and even of 
elements of decision to citizens because they converge the means, they tend to, they can't really be captured in the same way as these big structure. And therefore you have more fluidity of power. Now, if that was is applied to the instruments of militant democracy, some of the people like Almano, the good lobby, et cetera, we're worried that in the EU, in the name of you know, fight, uh, fighting against foreign interference, for instance, where you can kind of decrease the freedom of, say, NGOs, civil society groups. And well, I think citizens might be less captive to certain special interests than maybe, you know, other groups, but none of these should be left alone. It's all about polycentricity, checks and balance between checks and balances, right? So, um, yeah, so, so we, we need to take, you're so right, you know, that we need to take you know, calls for any citizen assembly with a grain of salt, because at the end of the day, they too can be manipulated, captured, etc. Also very hard to think about this transnationally, but that's also one of our, you know, agenda here. And that takes us back to Philip's question, basically, um, because of course, the whole justification for democracy is pluralism and heterogeneity. And yet at the same time, we are still wondering, what is the basis for the pluralism and the heterogeneity? Is it basically the individual or is it the other types of formations that the individuals enter into, be it organizations, cultures, and so forth? And that's the type of balancing act that we're constantly uh, struggling with in, in this sense. Uh, so it's, I think, I mean, I, I, I don't think we can avoid Kant in this, in the sense that uh, at the end of the day, if and at least if you formulate a, a legal system, there has to be a basis of individual autonomy. But how that then is configured and, and operated in in relation to the uh, to the world is is tricky. I think that at least sort of ideally speaking, there has to be some kind of cosmopolitanism, um, but it has to be more like a regulatory norm that permeates and, uh, and and asks questions to those that want and claim to be different, but that cannot be uh, authoritarian in the sense of imposing the, the need to be everybody, for everybody to be equal, but at least to be something that needs to be negotiated in relation to claims for difference and diversity. Sorry. So to have an ongoing debate, anyway. Mm, yeah. Sorry, sir, but I'm just wondering if anyone on that just we are wondering if yeah. anyone online would like to um, i have final, been watching final. for the final questions there's like a hand online but no you should know our friends online that we are you know looking at the screen if you have ever want to hand up and also in the next sessions maybe one last question if anybody wants to join Yeah, and the big one, uh, Marina Xenova, I'm assistant professor of criminal law in Madrid. So um, the discussion on multi-layer layered identities of citizenship is very close to my heart. And it also aligns very well with the natural law philosophy, which talks a lot about other directedness of justice and the neutral vantage point through which we can see justice and distribution. And it requires different layers of thinking, deliberating. So the idea of citizens assembly is very, very close to, to my heart, but I'm bringing a white elephant uh, in the room that is artificial intelligence. I know it's a big discussion, but there is a video circulating online by Tristan Harris, who is uh, head of Center for Human Technology and it's about AI dilemma. And the idea is that algorithms are going to change all institutions, including what we consider to be democratic institutions. So his claim is the last election, um, which will be human driven election is 2024 in the US. He's a US uh, practitioner, so he refers to the US. So what does it mean when it comes to this multi levered identity, especially, um, the challenges to authorship and agency. So what does it mean to author a rule if we are programmed by technology? What does it mean to have agency? And what does it mean for the concept of power in general? Because power is seen as coercion a lot. Perhaps in the future, it will be more about persuasion and the ability to influence. But I know it's a, it's a big question. So I just perhaps leave it open to the panel to consider. I would say that uh, I think we are very grateful for you to bring the question up now, but I think that we will devote more time to that tomorrow. Uh, 
and let it simmer because this, this is the fundamental question and, and it deserves real attention, not at, at the end of a session like this as a sort of a footnote, but rather let, 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 let's keep that in mind and see if we can squeeze that in tomorrow as, as part of the debate we have tomorrow because that is about the resilience aspect. A footnote to that, if you could actually also elaborate on the idea of the last human driven election, I think that would be really interesting. What does that mean? But uh, if you tomorrow, I'm sure it's fine. The program at STG on AI and democracy and our program on transnational democracy and technology. So these are fundamental questions, but I hadn't heard the expression, the idea that 2024 is the last one. Um, you know, I mean, the invocation of last is a, you know, and the last man, you know, <laughs> is one of those things uh, that, you know, brings a lot of, uh, uh, brings a lot of attention, but I, I agree. Maybe also in the second session, this will also become relevant. Well, there are but some lots to say. There Marina. are some ominous signals also from the US that this might be the last election anyway. Um, <laughs> Let's close this session and uh, we reconvene just after 4.30 for the next session. Thank you very much for now. And let's uh, give a hand to uh, Calypso and the other participants. Realism uh, in the EU. And what does it mean for the prospect for democracy to bounce back in the EU? This is partly John Eric's um, paper for this conference, which again is part of EU 3D, and also Max Stewart, who's um, online, who will intervene afterwards, and then we'll have Pablo and Aris, who are going to kick off the roundtable uh, after that. Thanks very much. Um, sometimes papers and works, or maybe even projects, have tangled um, origins. Um, I would say that this actually has. And I would date this back to the 70s. Um, when there was a power survey in the Norwegian society, where my colleagues, Johan Olsen and associates were examining power relations in Norwegian society, and one of them <laughs> Com complained and said, well, we had all the data, but Philip Schmidt had the theory. Um, and uh, <laughs> on, on social corporatism and, and his work. And actually this power survey came out with a term segment. And so they basically just, um, they basically um, leached or, or used um, the term segment in a more specific way and linked that fairly close to the iron triangles. In, in public administration and so on. And what I have done with colleagues, uh, Josef Batoa and the other Trondal especially, um, has been to try to lift this to a macroscopic level, to talk about the segmented political order, basically, and to think about the European Union as a segmented political order. So this is a particular twist on transnationalism by saying that there is this sort of segmentation. and. And the idea in, in, this, um, in this paper is to discuss the question of whether democracy can bounce back because the whole idea of a segmented critical order is one that is democratically deficient, one that has serious limitations in built into the very structure of this. So there's a distinct form of transnationalism we are talking about in a sense, and we're uh, linking back to the notion of segment and saying that we think that this might be the most fruitful notion uh, to use, but with the proviso that we lift this up to the microscopic level, because segments have been used, I mean, at least in, in mostly our political science, public admin, as meso-level phenomena, but we are thinking about this in systemic terms. And, and um, the history and context behind this, of course, is that the EU uh, has, according to Johan Olsen, a distinct birthmark, namely the marketization, but with an important promise of, namely that this marketization aspect was supposed to be serving greater political ends, namely to stabilize uh, peaceful relations in Europe. So because they were constrained in other ways, they used the economic integration to foster further integration and, and or the whole idea of functionalism and so on is below the terms, okay? But this generates a specific birthmark. And when you think about the European Union in democratic terms, the question is, has it all become this? And what does it really mean? 
And of course, what we have also seen uh, is, is that the integration process was driven by executives and experts, always has been. And the question has always been for democracy to catch up. To what extent can it catch up? Hence, to what extent can it bounce back in relation to this and take control of? It's difficult to think that a kind of real democracy is supposed to be leading a process like this, given the specific circumstances. The question, however, is can it catch up? Can it uh, hold experts and executives and so forth accountable and give direction to the overall project and, and ensure legitimacy? And of course, we're now talking about more than output legitimacy. And what we also have seen during the last decade and a half is that the crises have basically led to EU mutations. Some of you have seen that very clearly in the financial crisis. The new intergovernmentalists and so on are talking about um, um, uh, the, the uh, move shifting of power inside from the more democratically accountable institutions to the less accountable, especially the European Council, fashioning uh, 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 politics and so on. And it's a very interesting character, this European Council is chameleonic, and it, so it takes on a number of different functions. And, um, and it also breeds informality. We talked about arbitrariness in this. M much of the style of the European Council, both being self-contained, intransparent, and also um, in, weighing into, weaving itself uh, into various types of, of decision processes means that there's a fairly high level of informality. Bargains are struck in sort of a much more intergovernmental logic also in this. So that's part of uh, this. And Jonathan White has written nicely recently about the rise of informality. We've also seen the development of informal hierarchies inside the European, especially with the Eurozone. And we saw that very clearly in the financial crisis, where there were clear instances of, of domination and exertion of, of power, unjustified forms of power, basically. So the, the uh, basic angle of this paper is that it doesn't front load uh, the analysis with a set of democratic norms and principles or, or standards, but it starts from an analysis of what, of what the EU is and starts thinking about democratization in relation to that type of analysis. So the, idea, the thesis is that the European Union is a segmented political order. And the question is, can, can democracy catch up by desegmenting? So desegmenting in this case is intrinsic to the democratization, but it may not be enough. So one cannot equate desegmenting with democratization, but it certainly is a step in the right direction. So how far it is and what drivers and so on can ensure that this will be fully uh, is something that needs to be ex examined. And I will be doing that towards the end of this. So the idea of uh, a segmented political order is that it is a functionally imbalanced governing arrangement and it lacks the depth and breadth of hierarchically organized territorial control across the entire range of functions that we associate with the modern state. So this goes back to pre-modern forms of political order. It's not a sort of a new medievalism, but it refers to the fact that you can also in our modern times develop ambitious political systems that don't actually emulate the, the nation state in the depth and breadth of uh, integration and also socialization and so forth. So there are some of the state functions built into this, but it is imbalanced and also lacking the same depth. And I'll get into these uh, char characteristics of, of this type of segmented political order and say something about the European Union and then go into the uh, democratic bouncing back. And I'll try to do that in seven minutes. So the, the first idea of a, a segmented political order is a kind of a segmental logic. And I think marketization works. Maria Bachtel has written very nicely about this. Uh, the marketization logic in the European Union. And, and this has become deeply institutionalized as we see in the internal market dynamics. And it is a process that is much more driven through market making than through market correcting. 
this was then exacerbated. I mean, there has an element of the German or the liberal thinking behind this, but it was exacerbated during the financial crisis where the EU was turning more neoliberal and with the whole system of, of controls with the uh, through the financial crisis and so forth. So that that was a kind of a segmental closure that put this logic. But you also see a second type of dynamic in the EU, namely the um, the um, secur securitization logic find in, in especially in relation to asylum seekers and, and, um, and migrants and so forth. So there are two type, types of, of, of logics. They are very differently institutionalized. The marketization logic is institutionalized in the supranational system of the EU, whereas the securitization is interstitial. It's in between levels and operating and is, has a weaker uh, form of, of institutionalization uh, because it is in core state powers more operating so that it's not in the same way institutionalized and therefore not subject to the same types of, of political institutional constitutional controls that you find in the uh, in the uh, internal market and the second element of a segmented order is the bundle of policy instruments and the distinct policy style is aligned with the segmental logic especially for instance they use regulatory style and its lack of fiscal redistributive means and so on so that speaks to the part of the imbalance in, in this kind of construct. And also the organizational and procedural arrangements will sustain these segmental logics. I've already hinted to this by stating that the EU has two tracks, one more supranational, but it's supranationalism contained or constrained in certain ways. It's not a fully fledged supranationalism because the member states are so embedded in the EU institutions. So there are, it has actually been infected with the kind of intergovernmental logic or, or virus, so to speak, so that you don't have a fully fledged functioning supranationalism, partly also because of what Wolfgang Wessels is talking about in terms of fusion, that the levels of the EU are much more fused together. And this generates a much more self-contained system where member states are locked in, but they also lock in the EU and constrain its capabilities in that sense. And uh, the other more intergovernmental element is then supporting more this type of securitization logic. Um, and what I also think, uh, going back to the kind of birthmark in the European Union and drawing also on Jonathan White, is that this marketization logic especially is instrumentalizing institutions to pursue specific policy goals. And I think that is a very important insight in, in this relation, that the institutions of the EU are much more contained and, and compelled to pursue and, and ensure market making. And that in itself doesn't provide them with a the play, also because there are capacity constraints on the EU system. Therefore, conditioning the institutions much more and also serving to, to lock in this kind of segmental logic. So that's the, the, the idea that this segment of political order is fundamentally constrained. It's constrained in a material, but also in a normative sense, because the EU has not been imbued with competence, competence, and with um, the idea that the EU has a constitution, the treaties, you, you've seen this throughout. Therefore, that type of constraint on the EU means that it cannot claim um, legitimacy on a par with, with the state. It's, it's uh, in that sense, normatively constrained. It's materially constrained due to the very limited size of own, own resources and so forth, and therefore limited uh, ability to take actions. We saw this also in a previous intervention on, on the uh, militant democracy, the constraints built into the EU. Uh, and the EU is also externally dependent. It's, of course, the rise of populism, whatever we can, whatever really that is I mean, under this kind of heading, is also a kind of internal constraint on the European Union. Even if after Brexit, you have seen the change, Fabrini and, and, and et al are talking about sovereignty constraint, so that many of the Europhobes and Euroskeptics don't necessarily want to abolish the European Union, but they want to contain it, and they want to direct it to their ends. That might actually lead to integration in certain areas, including securitization, but it certainly will not lead to a strengthening of the democratic aspects of it. So in that sense, in a democratic sense, the EU is constrained by, by these forces. And the EU is heavily and highly externally dependent. We see that from in relation to the neighbors. We have seen it particularly now with the Ukraine war, with the energy dependence and so forth. And we saw it with the COVID, with the vaccines and, uh, and so forth. And, 
and in other ways. So that the external dependence and the whole idea of strategic autonomy that people are talking about is a certain element. And finally, therefore, the last element of this kind of segmented order is that this system is biased in that it has been policy and institutions set up to sustain a kind of segmental logic, but it is weaker in terms of the desegmenting dynamic. So implicit in this is that all political systems have built-in dynamics between segmentation and desegmentation. That's an intrinsic element. All states have segments built into them. Functional spheres are different. States are differentiated in different functional spheres, and all of these would have a propensity towards segmentation. If that is being locked in and, and amplified, then you would get an order that is segmented. But states have these types of, of mechanisms and so on that contribute to desegmentation. Parliaments, transparency bodies, ombudsmen's arrangements, many, many legal systems and so on to pry open and to ensure that there is um, that there is uh, transparency and, and accountability and so forth in the system. So there is a dynamic. And in the EU, this dynamic has been shifted towards the segmentation one, especially through the crises. Okay, so desegmentation and democratic bouncing back. So how much does democracy need to bounce back along the six segmentation lines? That's the first question. And the thing is in this is that it has to deal with the external dependence. It has to deal with the capacities so that for desegmentation, you actually have to increase more capacity. You might not even, you might not even need treaty change as much as you need own capacities. That's why the next gen EU is a very interesting example. If that can be perpetuated and resources bumped up more, then you can do quite a bit if you have more resources to change the whole uh, dynamics of the political game. But with the constraints that EU traditionally has had, it's gonna be very limited. So at least on, on the resources, uh, on, on the external dependence, I think that that will also if, uh, ease the, um, the, the, the uh, uh, some of the institutional dy dynamics, although one should be careful. Now, in terms of democratic, I would insist on the need to think about the representative system. And this is something that Dario Castiglione has, has written about, a very nice uh, article on this. And, and that is about a systemic understanding of democracy, that it's not the function of a parliament or parties, but it is this totality of democratic arrangements that are essential to the, 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 the capacious and uh, accountable systems of governing that we associate with democracy. So this works from citizenship through all the different channels to the system and to the representative bodies and horizontally in terms of preventing domination, executive domination and courts uh, becoming overweening and so forth. So it's both the horizontal domination and the vertical domination that this representative system can actually count in that sense. But then, then you need to look at the different aspects of this to see if they are actually functioning in a systemic viable way or if there are really uh, chinks in, in the armor on this one. Um, the parliamentary dimension would then be uh, important. Three possible options, strengthen national parliaments, strengthen inter-parliamentary cooperation or strengthen European parliament. They come with different um, different uh, uh, calculate, calculate, depending also on what type of system the European Union is. So the most transnational one would be interparliamentary cooperation. And I think that strengthening that can be beneficial, but not into an interlocking system because uh, that, that is problematic. Strengthening national parliaments and so on can also lead to cooptation. If they are too involved in the EU system, the way the EU is configured, they become co-opted. Strengthening the European Parliament is necessary, but not adequate. It's not sufficient. So part of this desegmentation, this would be part of it. So we, we have to think about other factors too, how they can, can help. And parties would also be interesting, but there is a conundrum in this because parties have transformed. They have lo lost or are losing social roots and they are turning into cartel parties, therefore becoming less embedded in society. So they are less reliable as channels than they had been before. So this is the irony for the European Union to embed democracy if it 
simply relies on the standard state model, it will have to face up to these types of challenges in the party system itself. And we are seeing that already in the way these parties are embedded in the European Union. And finally, many publics, what can they do? To what extent can they contribute to horizontal desegmentation and to reduction of domination at the whole between institutions? And in, in a sense, if the European Convention on the Future of Europe manages to get the treaty change, that actually is a horizontal contribution. Um, if, if the, there is a treaty change and that changes the dynamics, to what extent can many publics enhance the vertical between the, the different governments and the citizens? the connect connectivity and what is the role of many publics in the representative system is there a, a, a dedicated role i think this is precisely what where the debate is now to what extent are these types of various types of many publics embedded in a representative system or are they sort of adjuncts to it complements to it and is the eu as a less socially anchored system more dependent on many publics than would be states and what does that tell us about the type of representative system we get? And what does that tell us in terms of differentiation? What kind of functions can actually the EU undertake from a democratic perspective based on, on these types of, of constraints on the institutionalization of the system? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a, a very thorough, you know, conceptual frame to think about um, how, you know, the EU segmented, but also the global system. If the EU is segmented, the global system is to the power 10 segment. And I want to keep that back and forth because some of the scholars and policy people around this table are more concerned with the global. So we just really want to try to go back and forth between those two. And of course, you and I have discussed this, that the segmentation and the kind of political dynamics that it creates, the pathologies that it creates um, is, is true at all levels. And that in fact, indeed, um, it a lot contributes to it. And you indeed mentioned the courts. And so Max uh, Stewart, who's our good friend who uh, with whom we have worked on the Conference on the Future of Europe and on the many publics that you ended with uh, for a long time now is, uh, is online. And he's going to, um, he's also sent a little a short paper. So Max, uh, now the floor is yours to contribute to this agenda of democratic resilience. Thank you very much, uh, Calypso, and good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can see my slides and hear me well. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to present some ideas on this uh, excellent forum. Uh, and these ideas are, are based also partly in my involvement in the EU 3D a project within the Communist University team that is headed by uh, Josef Batora, um, as well as in uh, my interest in trying to connect courts and thinking about courts, judiciaries uh, and democracy. So uh, the kind of question that I would like to ask is what is the role of courts in protecting uh, and advancing democracy uh, in the EU and perhaps uh, how courts could be brought into the stories that we have heard uh, already at uh, today's workshop. Uh, I start with a premise that courts can or at least may be significant uh, for democratic uh, governance. And even if we are not kind of court enthusiasts, um, we may see that courts are influential. They, they are powerful uh, in certain circumstances. If you just look at the Court of Justice or we look at uh, several constitutional courts, the international human rights courts, uh, they, they can matter also for uh, global governance. There is all this debate about global uh, development at the, at the level of judiciaries, including uh, A.R. Benveniste's work on other regardingness and the capacity of courts to be perhaps more other regarding at certain circumstances than uh, other institutions. So courts are important, that, but then the question arises to what extent they can help perhaps with um, some of the problems of, of democracy um, and domination uh, that are present in the EU. And to reach this point of how courts could be helpful in the EU context, um, I will need to make another step, um, and this is uh, introducing a new concept that hasn't been mentioned today yet, of constitutional pluralism and the particular way of thinking uh, about courts and particular re relationships between courts in the EU, because we have the Court of Justice, as you know, and then we have uh, courts in the member states uh, of, the, of the EU. 
So the basic concepts that I'm working with here, constitutional pluralism, just uh, um, if you have not encountered this idea yet uh, at a kind of very general level, it's just a challenge to the hierarchical conception of law, uh, whereby you have to have a final arbiter, a final uh, constitutional or kind of uh, legal um, provision that uh, is the ultimate rule, and rather envisions a heterarchical idea, in a sense, a more horizontal idea of interaction uh, between legal orders, institutions, um, actors. Um, differentiation is the other concept that I'm working with, of course, partly because also uh, of the of the influence of the EU 3D project and uh, Professor Fossum's uh, work. Perhaps we could also use other ideas such as segmentation, but I just take differentiation as um, a, a, a potentially dominating um, a feature in the EU, as uh, where it was discussed in several previous contributions. And I'm not saying that we need complete differentiation to achieve uh, democracy, uh, but I'm rather saying that courts may potentially, and we could explore uh, the potential of courts uh, to reduce those features of differentiation, which lead to dominance. Um, so now the intermediate step that I would like to, to take here is to think how constitutional pluralism uh, comes into it. Um, it seems to me that generally there is a tendency to, to, to either think of the EU legal and more broadly even political uh, system as based on some kind of a hierarchy where either you have supremacy of EU law ultimately um, with the Court of Justice as its main interpreter or you have uh, the supremacy of national constitutions. And then you have the third alternative of this constitutional pluralism as kind of a more hierarchical conception uh, opposing to the hierarchies. However, uh, even these um, authors who wrote, write on these different positions seem to be in agreement that if we adopt a constitutional pluralist position, if we adopt the heterarchical position, uh, then necessarily the consequence is more differentiation. Necessarily, uh, the result is uh, that there will be more disagreements, more, more conflicts, more degrees of, of association, uh, if we put it that way. So, for example, if the German uh, Constitutional Court says that other, under certain narrow circumstances, EU law uh, is ultra-virus, then it is necessarily differentiating uh, in the EU. Uh, then there are different perspectives of authors, whether they are good, this, this is good or bad, and uh, mentioned some of them in the memo. Uh, but um, the, the point I try to make is that, well, uh, we can actually think of constitutional pluralism also in a non um, or de differentiating fashion. And this is where Republican uh, theory uh, comes in, that was also mentioned several times uh, today, with just the basic idea of prioritizing uh, non domination. Uh, over the unconditional primacy or supremacy of one legal order over another. So in a sense, it is taking away the discussion from legal orders and, and primacies and supremacies and focusing more um, on uh, the, the potential of achieving more freedom uh, and of also achieving higher standards uh, of human rights protection, particularly this idea uh, that through what I call tentatively Republican constitutional pluralism, uh, we could contribute to, we could help achieve a race to the top in human rights protection. So when uh, there is a national court uh, that defends uh, its, its national system, but in a case where this national system provides for higher standards of rights protection, then this is actually de-differentiating uh, in the uh, EU context because it may encourage uh, other courts and also the EU Court of Justice uh, to improve that standard. And the same applies, of course, vice versa, if the Court of Justice uh, defends that higher standard. Now, what does this conception imply for the potential, the perhaps even transformative potential to use the title from the workshop uh, of, of EU courts for, for democratizing? Um, so there is a lot of uh, thinking and, and, and discussion, and this also speaks to going beyond the, the EU, which I think is a, a strength, of course, of a forum like, like this, um, of transformative constitutionalism, of the potential of courts to actually raise issues and advance issues, particularly in relation to rights, uh, that are not really uh, typically advanced or effectively advanced by other institutions, including uh, parliaments, which of course are important for, for democracy. I'm not kind of denying that. Uh, but we have examples, for example, from global so South courts um, in terms of climate litigation, in terms of the possibilities uh, to maybe scrutinize increasingly uh, the, the rise of executive power um, that perhaps could be inspiring even for uh, the EU courts and would also encourage us to bring more uh, courts into this debate uh, about the role of institutions that 
uh, may help uh, reducing domination and especially because courts are institutions that we already have so these are not institutions that would be created uh, from from a new and potentially even enhanced complexity or enhanced uh, arbitrariness now the other reason uh, why i think courts are uh, are potentially promising is that there is a lot of deliberation uh, that courts and judiciaries um, uh, engage in. Of course, there is deliberation between the judges, but there is also deliberation between the judges and the broader, um, broader public, uh, the, the parties, um, political leaders, um, and so on. Now, there are, of course, uh, different models of deliberation. I don't have time to uh, get into it in relation to courts. And one problem, for instance, when it comes to the Court of Justice, to be more concrete, is that um, judges here cannot present separate opinions. And that is con uh, traditionally conceived of as a constraint uh, on deliberation. However, still the potential of courts to be deliberative fora and perhaps to also engage more with the broader public, and this is where the citizens' assemblies, the, the debate about um, participatory democracy comes in, uh, is certainly there. And there are even examples where judges from the world, where judges interact with um, you know, members of the public in, in different, different ways and that may advance potentially uh, democracy uh, in the EU. And finally, this is just a, a point on uh, how um, this perception of, of Republican pluralism and the potential of courts, both the Court of Justice and Member State court, Courts may help overcome the outdated views of courts as necessarily counter-majoritarian institutions, which is still quite a lot present uh, in, the, in the EU context, perhaps more than nowadays in the US context where Robert Dahl, in a sense, disproved this claim already with respect to the US Supreme Court uh, decades ago. Uh, so essentially, this is an invitation, and with that I conclude, uh, to uh, really think more about courts and, and the involvement of courts in also protection of democracy in the, uh, in the EU. As Frank has mentioned, courts are important in relation to deciding on, uh, uh, for example, many measures of, of, of protecting um, uh, democracy in the EU as well, uh, and um, uh, more broadly uh, for perhaps uh, the, the global, uh, more transformative transnational uh, potential. So thank you very much. Thank you, Max. Um, thank you very much for this very counter uh, present. You know, I, want, I remember in, when we did the, the convention more than 20 years ago, the Constitutional Convention, um, and it was at the same time as all the literature started on constitutional pluralism, and in fact, democracy at the same time. So how do you, how do you, can you have a stable polity without uh, a decider of last resort? Um, and indeed, um, it seemed to kind of unsettle notions of the courts. And the way you 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 take it uh, now as with this counterintuitive idea that constitutional pluralism, uh, which itself, I mean, is a version of segmentation that John Eric was speaking about, it can actually create a glue because it's a conversation and it could be a race to the top. Um, what I call um, the create a conversation of legal empathy um, um, is, is very, very interesting and important in this conversation. And I also like the fact that you bring in the reversing the gaze, what Europeans can learn from the global south or from not the global south as a, as a whole, but what courts or other regions are experimenting with. Um, and that's, I think, going to be a very important part of the bigger conversation, you know, in the months and years ahead. So thanks, Max. And now I want to turn to Pablo and Aris uh, for their initial comments and then open up um, the floor. Okay, so I'm gonna just comment very briefly three points from the previous presentation. Um, first of all, I think that um, a good way of starting is just addressing like the, the metaphor that opens the paper. Uh, can democracy bounce back? So my first point is with the, with the frame of the question. Because this question seems to assume like a clear uh, pre-crisis teleology towards the conformation of some sort of pan-European democracy, let's say. 
However, it, it, can be say, it, can, it can be said that much of the pre-crisis integration was premised on the idea that deep market integration was compatible with keeping what you call, and Philip Gensel called, uh, core state powers in the hands of member states. This is sometimes summarized with the idea of Keynes at home, Smith abroad, expressing the compatibility of EU-wide economic openness and national market correcting policies. Thus, core capabilities and political representation were supposed to be retained at the national level, while the EU was regarded as some sort of regulatory state away from mass politics. Therefore, I think uh, the metaphor of bouncing back has to be uh, clarified to some extent, making explicit the interpretation of this democratic baseline broken by the crisis. Bro broken <clears throat> by the crisis. Of course, I agree uh, that the crisis supposed a deep, a deep change on the quality of EU politics and the breakdown of national democracy in some member states. However, the paper seems to shift between the, between the idea that the crisis disrupted national democracy in debtor countries, which is clearly true, with the more controversial idea that the crisis supposed a break of an un underlying process of supranational Europe European democratization. Other central question is that of the role attributed to the disintegrative effect of the crisis. As it is pointed in the paper, European integration um, respected, respected since the beginning the national competence over core state powers. There is a growing consensus that the special significance of these powers makes them especially difficult to delegate and pull at the, at the supranational level. Thus, it is not just a misfortune that the crisis whose resolution demanded the partial pooling of such competencies ended up having such a segmenting and, and disintegrative effect. This indicates that this crisis were not just an unfortunate event that compromised the construction of a European democratic order. Rather, they express, it, they express the transition to a more delicate sphere of integration in which supranational strategies are not so easy to accommodate. After all, as Philip Gensel, Philip Gensel notes, the integration of core state powers seems to have a paradoxical event in the EU, where more integration leads to more segmentation of the polity away from the ordinary federal and democratic ethos. Given these difficulties and the link defended, defended in the paper between representation and capability as two sides of the democratic idea, there seems to be a considerable pull to take the national state as the by default option for the democratic bouncing. In consequence, if we really want to advocate, as this paper, I think it does, for a more federalist view that vindicates the need of further democratization along federal lines, despite the obvious obstacles in the path, I think that more has to be said about the nature of such uh, choice. In this aspect, it is important to highlight the kind of interests and values that, democratic, um, that a democratic European Union can serve. The arguments can be of a very different nature. They can be uh, functionalist arguments regarding the need to govern European public goods, um, arguments about the obsolescence of the state in the age of, glo of globalization, or can be more normative arguments of a more cosm cosmopolitan nature. As the paper uh, argues, different institutional models might follow depending on whether we see the EU more as a federation in the making or as an intergovernmental forum. For this reason, it's important to explain the urgency of strengthening the European Parliament to reconstruct the conditions of democratic politics at the supranational level instead of just taking the apparently easier route of reinforcing the status of already constituted member states. And with these comments, I think I'm finished. Thank you so much, uh, Pablo, to come back to the very basic 
point about core powers and what does that do? What does segmentation do? Does segmentation go all the way within the core powers? And um, at a time when uh, the green transition and the digital transition that I started with this morning earlier, you know, involve very much core power. Um, how, what does this imply for the capacity to, to deal with them? So thank you, Pablo. And now Aris. Thank you, Calypso, for uh, the invitation. Uh, it's, it's great to be here, a lawyer amongst political scientists. So please allow me for uh, this uh, discretion. Um, super interesting topics, presentations. Um, I will uh, read in much more detail after we have this discussion, the, uh, the paper. Some, some, some first thoughts uh, based on the, um, the two submissions that we've heard today in this panel. Uh, apologies, uh, I'm Aris Georgopoulos. Uh, I come from the University of Nottingham. I'm visiting fellow here at the SPS exactly because I want to engage with uh, colleagues that they are not only lawyers. Uh, so I'm very glad for that opportunity. Um, 11 years, uh, sorry, 12 years ago, with some other friends that Calypso knows very well, uh, we organized in, two, that was March 2012. Uh, at the peak of the crisis, the economic crisis in, uh, in, in Europe, uh, we organized a colloquium where we were trying to, we were grappling with these uh, ideas and what was going on at the time. Remember, uh, Greece uh, the, and, and Italy, the previous autumn, had de facto replaced the prime ministers overnight. Uh, simply because certain decisions that they were taken. So the, the, the title of the, of the colloquium was No Country for Old Systems, Column, Democracy, Technocracy and the Markets. And it seems to me that the, the, the core of, uh, the, of the present colloquium is around these new dynamics, how to devise a new system of governance, you hate the, the term, but this the way of moving about and living our lives uh, between the public and the private, uh, that takes into account all the new developments that cover. I will not even mention AI, we'll have the chance to do that tomorrow. So, to the papers. Uh, you mentioned about segmentation. Uh, of course, the, the look was in the context of the EU, but I would argue that there is a, a especially uh, even at the global level, a fundamental segmentation, no matter which country we want to look at, which is the financial uh, markets. And that you have a, a, a very significant aspect of governance that is completely or to a large extent independent from any democratic underpinning even of the kind that we see applied in the context of the European Union and this has nothing to do with the European Union this is much more global so I wonder whether this element of segmentation has already it's 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 a it's a it's a given even at the global level right from the point of view of finance we, we, the the prime minister of the UK post brexit was replaced due to market reaction. Whether that was a good thing or another, that's besides the point, but that's the fact because of a market reaction to a specific decision that was supported by our elected parliament in the United Kingdom, right? Okay, so that's point number one. Uh, with regards uh, of Max's uh, very, very interesting paper about this instru potential instrumentalization of courts into achieving sort of improving the democratic uh, outcome or conditions or creating a, a policy of, in, of uh, uh, plurilateral, well, sorry, of, of pluralism within the European uh, Union I have a philosophical fundamental issue with uh, the legitimacy, the point of the legitimacy of courts being used for political desiderata. What is the legitimacy of courts to function in this? Who decides which the political, what the political desiderata are, which already takes us back to, to the earlier points about what sort of governance do we have? 
how is the demos or the demo as Calypso rightly it's the most one of the most beautiful and we, we, you have to get some royalties for every time that somebody uses the term democracy, right? Uh, think about that. You should definitely uh, uh, try. So, but how does that relate back to, 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 to this sort of fundamental uh, underpinning? If one looks at how the European Court of Justice has functioned over the last uh, um, uh, 50, 60 years, that's definitely a uh, we could say that uh, it has been used, but what about national courts? Even within that framework, we've had cases where one might argue whether one agrees with the outcome. I used the example of Greece, where the uh, one formation of the Council of State, the, the Conseil d'État, which is the, the highest administrative court in, in Greece, had ruled about the fundamental contradiction in violation of constitutional principles of some of the mem uh, uh, of, of the uh, uh, memoranda that gr the Greek governments, consecutive governments, signed during the crisis. Then, of course, that was reversed by the uh, plenum, but of course, a plenum that everybody acknowledges was functioning under a very, very pol clear political external and internal Damoclean sword. So these are the, 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 the two points I would like to raise, the segmentation. I think there is much wider uh, point to be made gl at global level. Of course, the point of legitimacy of the courts acting as uh, towards achieving political desiderata. Thank you. Bringing back the, the Greek context, which informs, continues to inform us all because it's a paradigm. It's not just Greece in and of itself, we hasten to say. So, and, and also the financial market segmentation, uh, which again, I would like to repeat is, is, is not just European. Um, and, and clearly in the context of uh, the changing facets of, of uh, weaponized interdependence and the way in which many countries around the world now are questioning the unilateral governance of some of these elements, these bits of the segmented system, or the partial governance by some actors and not others, um, then you know the financial market is, is very important because we remember how the U.S., uh, leverage its control of SWIFT during the Ukraine war to say, okay, now some, some will have access to SWIFT and others won't. And that indeed kind of creates this, this, this these dilemmas of segmented governance. Um, and, and indeed the role of the courts in, in these stories, Max um, and, and John Eric, did you want to reply quickly or should we open yes. up? Okay. Well, this is great. Actually, um both to, to Pablo and Aris, uh, very useful comments. We are working on, I'm working together with two colleagues, Sayusa uh, Patra and uh, Yala Trondal, to uh, come up with a book on this. So these comments are very useful. Actually, Yosef is presenting uh, sort of a similar paper, not democratic bouncing back, but more on the segmented aspect at USA, uh, a panel that I organized, but I, for some reason I can't be there. Um, now, I, uh, I think. Um, uh, on, on Pablo, your comments, um, <laughs> some time ago, you know, we didn't have to answer a question about the uh, justification for the European Parliament and so forth. It was sort of more self-evident. I, I realized that the discourse has, has changed on this, but um, um, the, the, uh, the, the, as long as the idea of congruence that we talked about in Calypso session is one where powers now, are, when powers now are determined at the European level, regardless of what kind of institutional mechanism, whether it is coordinated by states or um, actually organized by supranational institutions, that it brings up the question of Congress, of that decisions made at that level also need um, to be held accountable by a body that has a direct citizen uh, uh, sanction in this sense. So, so I think that that in itself, that the European Union has developed to this level itself necessitates the debate on a type of popularly elected assembly. So I'm, I'm, I, I disagree with Bellamy, his uh, uh, 
republicanism where he mixes this with the cosmopolitanism because i don't think that individual states peoples can do that without a directly elected uh, body and i also disagree with his notion of the european parliament as being um kind of uh, what's it called again um it's he talks about it more in democratic terms the parliament itself is I, I i disagree with that analysis of the european parliament i think it is more of a supranational body in itself that has a self-identity as such um, but it's also he, just to be fair yeah it's like the court in a way, like Max's courts in a con continual conversation from their very different tradition. Uh, the parliament itself is a place of multinational conversations mm -hmm. where you don't necessarily always see consensus on everything. So that's also the idea. It's not so much about imposing rules from above, but this horizontal interpenetration. Sure. So in that sense, it can be a democratic affair. It, and similarly, the, the General Assembly these days um, is trying to move in that direction, trying to overtake some of the functions of the UN Security Council if there was a veto. And that's also in a direction of a kind of a democratic global parliament, I think. Again, to get make this connection between the, the European and the national. So, I just just yeah. to push back a tiny bit here, um, for the second conversation, John Air. Well, yes, and um, and it it is it still is is a very important question about the division of powers, and and again, what kind of role the European Union should be playing. And I think, and and in that sense, I'm actually critical of what I call marketization de differentiation that the marketization logic goes into so many areas of life in the EU that actually should not have been regulated by the European Union. So I'm not, I'm, I'm very critical of the idea of centralization. I'm much more dedicated to federalization, but to work out in a more transparent manner what should be dealt with at the European level and what should be dealt with at the national level. And I think that is basically the, the, the question in this. And that means that, that the European Union will always be a multitude of demo but I'm making a case for the need to have an institutionalized notion of Europeanness also as, as an adjunct to this or as an as integrated element of that. So this brings in the whole question of federalism. So uh, I wouldn't be, uh, I think the, the biggest mistake in, in, in Europe has been to buy the Eurosceptic UK notion of federalism as centralization. That's utter bullshit. Uh, it, is, it is much more dynamic and interactive process um, the whole idea of federalization and it's as much a question of protecting subunits as uh, enabling the, the central unit so the whole point i mean calypso also has worked extensively on this um it is precisely to work out the type of federalism that works for the european union which is such a a complex system and that is an intellectual challenge and we cannot use the simple templates from other states and so on. So the European Union itself also must justify to the subunits, the member states, the type of functions it, it uh, undertakes. So there has to be a process of justification in this. And, and to some extent, one can then discuss also the legal pluralism in this picture, to what extent you, you should lock it uh, in terms of, of uh, actually granting competence, competence, or whether you can actually embed a kind of a federation in more uh, legal pluralist terms. I think that's in itself a, a debate that is worth taking also under a federal heading. So, so I just want to, to, to uh, push back on, on this idea of, uh, I don't, I'm not saying, saying that you claim that, but I'm simply saying that there is this notion uh, or, or this propensity to equate federal federalization with centralization and i think that is a mistake the, the problem for me with the european union is that the fact that there isn't an agreement on what type of entity the union is or should be means that basically all the institutions in the eu are programmed to centralize or to amass power at the european level so this is the irony of not actually acknowledging what type of entity the european union is they are basically um coded for integration and amassing powers. And I think that actually is a negative element. So in a sense, trying to lock this would also, in, in that sense, curtail the scope of the European Union. And then comes in the whole question of the relationship to core state powers and what actually is core state powers in this sense. So, yeah, thanks. Um, uh, th thank you, John. Max? 
Sure. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Maybe very briefly, um, is constitutional pluralism desegmenting or segmenting? So I, I, I do think that um, we, for this approach, need to narrow the scope of examples and instances for which we use the label of constitutional pluralism. So the decision of the Polish Constitutional Tribunal um, on invalidating EU law, which by the way is a, a tribunal that is illegitimately constituted, would not be an example of constitutional pluralism and would certainly be an example of, 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 of segmentation as, as uh, you know, also mentioned in the paper. Um, but um, an instance of, for example, uh, a court uh, that says there has to be some limit to the uh, implementation of the European arrest warrant in case we in our jurisdiction offer higher standards of procedural rights protection over what the EU average is or of the other jurisdiction is. That in my reading would be an example uh, of, of constitutional pluralism because it prompts this race to the top of, of, of rights protection. And in that sense, uh, it can be de-segmenting if the other jurisdictions are also then prompted, incentivized perhaps through this uh, conversation of legal empathy, I need to look into this uh, concept of, of Calypso, uh, that uh, is, um, uh, is uh, to, to reduce the, the scope of domination. Uh, so on the comment of the legitimacy of uh, court, Professor Ice, thank you very much. Um, yes, so this is a major, major issue, of course, and maybe I should clarify that I would not see courts as some kind of instrumental uh, actors that would then be used by others to maybe advance their conceptions of democracy. And certainly there is this dimension in, in courts, including in legal mobilization um, theories that you know, social movements reach the courts with their claims. They want to, of course, win and, 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 and implement their uh, preferred um, view. But in a sense, um, the court should decide. The court should operate uh, in uh, the scope of its uh, jurisdiction, in the, uh, in the scope of its competencies, interpreting, interpreting the law. So it, it just does, it work, does its work, but this work has some implications. And I'm suggesting that uh, we can um, maybe encourage uh, ways of thinking uh, that these implications uh, will, be, uh, will be helpful for democracy, not that necessarily uh, we need to somehow manipulate, uh, manipulate the court. And where is the, the legitimacy? Well, um, judges are and courts are enshrined in constitutions, um, in, in treaties in case of the Court of Justice, which have some sort of uh, delegation chain. Um, so we could go into other justifications for why you know, courts um, also, as Professor Sheppel mentions, uh, can be useful uh, for uh, raising some claims that actually the democratic majority cannot raise uh, through parliament. So there is a range of range of reasons for why, why which they can be seen also as, as legitimate actors. But that is not to say that you know they can that they should be used by others and, and instrumentalized uh, in in that sense. But I would be happy to continue that conversation separately. Also, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you raised social movements because again, we're talking Europe, we're talking global, and and indeed the the deep fundamental question right, right now whether courts and networks of courts can be transformative in the green transition. Um, we know that actually there's a movement of courts to become more repressive right now, including in Europe. I mean, in the UK, there was just a judgment of two guys who were in a hammock in a big highway bridge for three days, and they got getting two days, actually, and they're getting three years in prison. There are lots of examples in France. And so on, until recently, there was this very notion that supported your, your, your idea, Max, of race to the top. But if you, if you, from a kind of political liberal viewpoint, um, you, you're also seeing that the courts are political, uh, whose last word it is, it's not clear, but uh, the potential, transformative potential of that pluralism can go in either direction, as it were. And I think we should uh, note that in passing. Um, so I'd like to look at the questions in the, in the, yes, please, and introduce yourself. Yes, hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Judika Elitin. I'm a visiting fellow in the Department of Law. I'm also a lawyer. Uh, I come from the European Parliament. I'm a member of the legal service in the European Parliament. Um, and I would like to share with you uh, uh, some uh, experience quite, uh, quite recent. Uh, it is very tempting uh, with the presentations by Professor Fosum and Max Steuer uh, to bring this in. Uh, it concerns precisely the, the role of parliamentarism and the courts. Uh, in fact, uh, 
what we see, I'm used to a much more trivial vocabulary, sorry, but what we see on a daily basis uh, in Parliament uh, currently since uh, the succession of crises and experience to, to address the crisis, um, there is quite a, a very dynamic and vivid debate in the Parliament on uh, some of these experience to the crisis and some of the solutions that exclude the Parliament, basically, uh, from a uh, very uh, practical uh, procedural point of view. I have to say, and this is what I wanted to share with you, that we see uh, it corresponds to some extent to some majority currently, that there is some understanding that also supporting solutions where parliament is not formally involved is uh, a very major exercise of parliamentarism in the sense that it is also a way to express support to a solution that needs to be the solution defended in the context of hostility within the EU and hostile environment, growing hostile environment outside the EU. So I just wanted to share with you this, that uh, supporting solutions that do not necessarily involve the parliament, I, I think of uh, uh, initiatives that have a legal basis excluding the parliament from the decision-making process is also perceived by some as a very specific expression of parliamentarism uh, that can lead to some misunderstandings on uh, the role of parliament and the way it is conceived, uh, but it has a direct link also with uh, litigation, with recourse to the court as an actor in this apportionment of roles, but it is to some extent in some files in some context, uh, some understanding of what should be the role of parliament in the context of the current crisis. Thank you. Thank you for this comment from within. And uh, perhaps John Eric, did you want to reply to this or comment? No, we will. Other other question and comments, um, and indeed not necessarily questions. I mean, we, uh, comments on on this problematic, and of course, I mean. I do feel that we're still a bit in the pre-Ukraine poly crisis where, you know, all of these questions of markets and, but of course now we have defense and segmentation there too. Um, there will be a question as to the role of courts in, in this whole there and, and um, what does it mean for democracy? Because of course we know that as, the more we go into these areas, the less there is a common sense that, these areas should be democratized. I mean, this is a kind of domain reserve. So perhaps we also need to bring this back in. But uh, the, yes, there was a hand. Was there a hand in the? Philip. Philip, you had a hand? I didn't. No, I don't think so. He didn't. OK. Which you don't want to enforce. <laughs> well, I. I hesitate, but um, this is not the first time that we discover that we're thinking about similar in taking a similar perspective. Your concept of segment is certainly easier to pronounce than the Dutch Zeuling, which nobody else, but it's and it's the main reason why it is much better to think in terms of consociational than, rather than federalism. Federalism is a dead end as far as Europe is concerned. And I think this is very, you make it very clear why this is the case. So consociationalism is a much better point of departure. As you probably know, I, the theory that I used to, to think of the European integration is uh, very much oriented around crisis. Crisis have actually been a very good thing it's perfectly understandable and predictable almost. Uh, the only problem, of course, is that the present crisis has three characteristics which are very different than the previous ones. For one thing, they're multiple. So in the past, the EU dealt with single crises sequentially, so to speak. Now we've got multiple crises on top of each other, which produce very unpredictable uh, kinds of situations, cleavage patterns, etc. They are uh, also uh, not generated by integration itself. They are exogenous by and large to the integration process, whereas the kinds of crises that I'm used to thinking about 
are generated by integration itself. Now it's being more of an endogenous. And, and of course, uh, as I say, they're multiple simultaneous and exogenous. So this, this is a crisis. Now, so the, the idea that crises are a good thing for European integration, I think obviously has to be questioned. Now, on the question of democracy bouncing back, it's not at all, I think there's a huge amount of exaggeration about how badly democracy has somehow bounced, the implication is bounced back, no. Uh, it certainly has been challenged, and that's a good thing. It's perfectly normal that democratic systems have crises. And, uh, uh, uh. and in fact, the crisis of the national democracy is much, much greater than that of the European Union. The real crisis of democracy is occurring at the national level, not at the level of the European Union. And although I'm suspicious of public opinion and Eurobarometre in particular, nonetheless, uh, the data is pretty clear that there, there hasn't been a much more dramatic change in attitudes toward the European integration. The real dramatic changes have come at the national level in terms of the status, prestige, trust in national politicians. So that's, uh, but I think at the core of everything that where, where I would concentrate is exactly what you suggest in the paper, namely, it's liberalism, not democracy, that is really at source. It's the transformations that liberalism brought to democracy that are mostly at, in crisis, and the core of that is representation, although the role of courts certainly figures in that list of liberal uh, modifications of uh, democracy, but it's representation. And so the question that I pose to you is in a segment, what is the role and the potential for a European party system, given that you have this fundamental segmentation of the units that are involved? So how much do we expect now? One of the things, and I will just remind you, you know it, of course, is that dear old Karl Deutsch, one of the original theories of European integration, had the idea that if you become increasingly functionally interdependent, you will get a change in the nature of, so those pillars or segments will gradually dissolve. People will live in each other's country, go to each other's schools, marry each other, even for goodness sakes, and that's happening. And what's more, it's very generational. So there's no doubt that that process that Deutsch talked about is happening. And it's more, the younger you are, the more likely you are to have these kinds of cross-national, depillarized, whatever you want to call it, experiences. So it's simply in part a matter of time that you will get this, so the pillar, the segments you're talking about, if Deutsch is correct. And I think, you know, by and large, that's happening. So that's part of the answer is just wait a little bit. You were, we're asking too much of the situation at the present. But it is true that I think considering the general rules of the EU, that the amount of people who are working and living effectively in each other's countries is much less than we expected. There's much, been much less population movements of these things. It's going to happen, I think, and it's happening more and more, but it's certainly the initial experience is less than I think one would have predicted from simply removing the barriers, but people still are fundamentally rooted in those things. So the question is, what kind of a democracy, if we agree, and I think we probably do, that the core of liberal democracy is representation and in specifically political parties, there's no doubt, however, that there is a European civil society. There are plenty of social movements and occupational groups and who cross national borders and are very active. So that part of the thing is, I think, by and large, there's literally not a single uh, 
occupation or cause, so to speak, which doesn't have some kind of a genuinely European expression and is active, right? It's political parties. Now, the problem, of course, is, and this is why I think it's such a challenge, is that political parties at the national level are in terrible shape also. So it's not as if we're in a period where political parties are suddenly uh, gaining in uh, status and in attractiveness for uh, citizens. So I was looking, and then I didn't get a chance to read the bouncing back at the at, in, in, in any suggestions, but uh, I will send you the paper. I've written a paper on how to imagine a European party system, but I Thank want you. to hear you, your, you have are you in agreement that, that the party system at the so European just, level yeah. is in some sense the bedrock of what <laughs> we're looking for and what can you do about Sorry, it? Sorry, we, we need to okay. move on because um, we slowly want to come to a close and I want to give uh, John Eric and uh, Max, you know, the last words, but so if there's any Last comment, um, uh, and then you turn to you. Yes. If I may, just one, uh, a couple of brief points I was uh, reflecting on. So I uh, really appreciated this idea of the of the segmentation and desegmentation as a interpretive lens. And I, I, want, I want to just Sorry, I forgot to, some, uh, to introduce myself. I'm Giuseppe Ganada. I'm a PhD researcher at uh, Scuola Normale, Downhill. And we're neighbors. And yeah, and uh, particularly one of the points I wanted to raise is about the role of crisis in this world framework and, and this, this discussion. Because I was thinking, uh, as you presented the, uh, the, 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 the paper, the crisis were uh, somehow conceived as a causal uh, factor in segmentation. But uh, I was wondering, uh, couldn't it be that they are just make more visible what's already there? So it's not, uh, well, it, it's also, but not just a matter of uh, causality, but uh, of making visible what's already uh, there. Uh, a second point was about the, um, uh, yeah, this uh, idea of disconnect, disconnect uh, vertical horizontal disconnect between what the EU institution do, uh, do and the uh, the people, so the uh, citizens. And uh, I, I was wondering if the um, recent research in uh, on this idea of uh, responsiveness would fit in this uh, uh, in this framework because there there has been uh, the uh, uh, growing interest on the way in which European institutions, uh, the Commission, for instance, uh, uh, preventively take into account uh, public opinion. Uh, I know that equating public opinion like responsiveness to public opinion to uh, democracy can be challenging, but. This idea might be also uh, might fit in the discussion and be also uh, considered as a prognosis of how to address segmentation. And yeah, uh, yeah, that's it basically. I have further points, Matt. Yeah, Giuseppe. Thank you, thank you, Giuseppe. So we have quite a lot on the on the table, um, and um, and and we we need to worry at the end of the day whether. Um, in this transformation, the international system, we are coming up with institutions that can curb abuses of power at any level uh, through innovations and new democratic ways, or is that a, new, a utopia? So um, uh, pe perhaps first, Max, and then you, or do you want, okay, you first. I, I was going to reverse the order, but okay, you're ready to jump in, I, John Eric. Yeah, I was um, on. Um... And thanks, thanks for both uh, comments. Uh, let me go to this last one on responsiveness, of course, is very important because it's intrinsic to representation. Um, that's the sort of a deep understanding and, and assumption in, in representation. Now, there's also a funny thing about this paradox of democracy, which came out in a book uh, just a few years ago on the, on the um, policy accumulation trap, namely that Respond, uh, democracies can be so responsive 
that they breed populism because they promise to do things because they want to be responsive, but they end up with implementation bottlenecks. So, so in reality, they can't deliver on all the things they promise to do, not because of lack of will, but lack of ability. So there is a, this is sort of a democratic uh, dilemma, actually, in a sense that, that it also says something. I mean, this is kind of an odd thing to say from a conservative, almost like a conservative perspective, say, look, you have to prioritize and you have to tailor things gradually. I mean, that's another challenge to democracy, too. You can't simply just accept and do everything. You actually have to make prioritizations. So that's a hard choice that democracies also need to do. And of course, the timelines of democracy makes that very difficult. So, uh, and, and responsiveness is also something that Peter Mayer is playing on, and this feeds, feeds into the idea of parties, and, and the point about responsiveness and responsibility. And he argues that you've got a new constellation, and this feeds into your question too, the new constellation now of responsibility and responsiveness in parties, in the sense that because of the legal lock-in you have, I mean, the democracy constrained, as Müller talks about in the European Union, that courts and, and law has regulated the number of things, and keep in mind how legally regulated the internal market is, means that a lot of politics is locked down, and therefore parties in power, therefore are ob obligated to follow international rules. So this is one of the problems of legally regulated globalization, that it hems and, and contains the room for, for politics, actually even as a problem-solving activity. And that means that you get bifurcated functions among, between parties uh, that governing parties often not only can be cartel parties, but also lo locked in on responsibility, that they have to fulfill international obligations. And then they don't necessarily communicate this well to the publics. And there you get the scope for populist backlash because they can push on the respons responsiveness and say, look, we are the ones who are authentic about people. We are the ones that are responsive. Look at these other guys, you know, they are outsiders. They are, they are elites. They are foreigners, you know. This is a typical uh, trope of, of populists, you know. So they put this up and generate this. On, and, and of course, party systems are, are, are fed by this. And when the social roots have diminished and when uh, societies have become multi stories you don't have the ideologies organizing life anymore in the same sort of left right fact faction or anything like this but you have a multiplicity of stories it's much more difficult to orientate parties in in that sense and and the lack of social rootedness of parties also makes them less reliable the whole idea also of partisanship i mean there's a beautiful book by by uh, uh, nancy rosenblum on on uh, the, normati the, the normativity or the lack of normativity of parties in, in normative theory. Uh, political parties um, had few expectations or, or there were few normative expectations political parties could disappoint, is what Nancy Rosenblum says. Because normative theory really hasn't hammered out the good place for parties because they are programming the whole political perspective from the citizen uh, groups to the political system. So parties are the workhorses of these systems, and yet normative theory has basically shirked, shirked away from giving them a proper role. And yet the institutional transformations and also the transformations of partisanship are coming in and actually reducing their ability to carry that role that we had been conventionally seen. And that's why I brought this thing up about mini publics and so on and ask what can be possible replacements or what can be necessary complements to parties to, to, for representative democracy to function. So this is a deeper problem, much more systemic. So the populist idea and fake news and so on, that's noise. It's a deeper, more fundamental issue in terms of the social anchoring of conflict structures and so on in society. We had, I mean, I grew up as a student back in the Neolithic age, you know, in, 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 um, uh, with, with the freezing of party systems from Lipset and Rockan. Now it is an unfreezing, it's a much more uncertain terrain. So it's much more unreliable parties are in that sense. And that's why we need to think much more seriously in terms of democratic theory. What are the carriers, the institutional carriers of democracy today? I think that's what I will end up with as a question. And, and you know, but your point about party leads to the point about horizontal movements. I've been working with trade unions in Europe, feder federated trade movements, social movements, etc. And of course, the silver lining of the story is that in today's world, and especially transnationally, we need to be able to break polarization, especially effective polarization, which replaces the kind of more 
integrative ideologies of parties that dealt with everything. Now people are in their kind of corners, but I believe, and I've written about this, that most citizens actually um, uh, are ambivalent. There's so much ambivalence in truly in most people as individuals. And it's only the trap of certain kind of politics that forces people to go into their ideological niches. And what we need to rediscover is a way to collectively tap in our ambivalence, which then makes it possible to talk to one another. Um, and so that's a new idea of party transnationalism, citizen assembly help, um, but there are structures that are less freezing of opinions than others. And I, our role, I think today, this, this um, workshop is also about thinking about the, the transnational in that way, that it can transform not only what happens transnationally, but feed back into kind of new dynamics at the national level. So I'm always trying to get the silver lining from a democratic viewpoint. But Max, you have the last word before we, unfortunately, without you, we'll move to a, our cocktail um, at the end of this uh, uh, first day of workshop. Thanks a lot. Well, maybe just uh, one very quick uh, point on uh, on courts, unsurprisingly. Um, so, so I think there is a potential for courts being desegmenting, but, uh, and this maybe I failed to emphasize in previous interventions, this also requires work from courts. So not just from other actors who are reaching the courts or interacting uh, with courts, but also courts themselves need to embrace this, this role and be, be self-aware in that sense. And I actually don't think there is a lot of courts uh, in the EU today that have this uh, um, role embraced at, at the moment. I mean, partly we have illiberal regimes which have their problems, but even the Court of, uh, Court of Justice, even though there are some exceptions, is not really, I think, embracing this, uh, this logic and rather follows uh, also the prioritization of free market. There are cases uh, in, in that regard. So this also requires work from, from courts and perhaps um, that's where the theories of democracy that were mentioned come, come in and going beyond uh, liberal theories of democracy, but just uh, seeing more deliberative theories of democracy and how courts can um, play a role in, in those uh, ways of thinking about uh, democracy. Thank you. Well, that was very efficient and uh, uh, ending on a potential trend. That's transform transformative is indeed a, a potential. Well, I think we have um, had lots of interesting you know, I played with lots of interesting ideas today at the confluence of, um, of, of pluralism, fragmentation, diversity, but also new modes of integration um, without forgetting that power symmetries are the name of the game. Tomorrow, well, Pavel just stepped out, but we will start with his very interesting report um, that links, you know, attitude of peoples towards each other to moments of war uh, uh, in today's Europe, and then move on to a kind of closing roundtable. So all of the, you know, Marina has the frustration that she wants to bring back AI, and she's so right. I mean, technology is so important in this story. Um, so what does technology do to all of our uh, conversations, but we will, you know, really have a last session, a bit of a free for all to, but I will want to collect potentials and we will want, I think I can speak on behalf of both of us to collect potentials for uh, transformation. So I'd, I'd like to now thank uh, uh, Pablo and Aris for their discussions, uh, discussing points and uh, Max and John Eric, my co-convener for very, very interesting papers. So.